Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. p.m. Let's see, pro, uh, we're going to start in accordance with this, in accordance with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, signed by Governor Baker on June 16, 2021, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 30A. This meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings. Welcome everyone. So we're gonna begin with public input. If anybody has anything they'd like to speak about, funny Dr. Daly asked me about this earlier today. Like I always say, if it's not on the agenda, just to be very clear, if there's something on the agenda you wanna speak about, we will let you speak at that time. So we're not telling you, you can't speak about that. Um, but if you have anything, anybody in the public wants to talk about something that's not on the agenda, please raise your hand or unmute. Hearing none. We will go to the student report and then we will go to our special guests, the retirees. But we're going to start with and, Paris, yeah. if she's here. What? So unfortunately, our student reps are not able to be here. Oh, Paris is not able to be yeah. here. And I think it's officially summer in their calendar, so we'll probably work with them again. Great. Excellent. So now we will go to the retirees. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Daly to sure. present a little bit here. Thank you so much. So I'm very excited to have uh, with us this evening. Um, members of our, our school community who are retiring, um, and we just want to thank them for their tremendous service to our district and to um, share share them with the full committee. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to give them some thanks and appreciation. They were given uh, some some gifts, some retirement gifts, and, and we were able to deliver those to them um, over the last few days of the school year. So Susan Hagerty, reading specialist at the Hood School. Charles Osgood, computer science teacher at the middle school. Wayne Shank, science teacher at the middle school. Jean Walsh, a reading teacher at the middle school. Mary Staples, the administrative assistant at the high school. And Sharon Detroit, food service associate at the middle and high school. So thank you folks um, for all of your service. It's really, really been a tremendous um, time working with you. I've worked closely with you. You know, Susan is a curriculum leader. Um, you know, Wayne and I go way back to when I was assistant principal at the middle school um, and working closely with Jean and Chip and um, I was able to see Sharon today as well and of course Mary um, with all her great work you know in the high school office so I think you all know how much you mean to me and how much you've meant to this district and I'm just so glad that you're able to join us here tonight to hear the appreciation of our whole committee. So Thank, thank you, all the retirees. I hope you, we still give you gifts, even though you're not here. Usually we get to at least hand you something. So I hope, <laughs> hope we're still going to at least give you some gifts afterwards. Um, I, I, I would just say, you know, I don't know what it is. I feel like every time my kid gets to a level, that's when the, the most people retire from that, that level. So my oldest got to the middle school this year, and it seems like the middle school has, has a mass exodus at this point in time. But, you know, while I, while I haven't gotten to know everybody here. I think one thing that we really love about this district are the teachers and the educators in this district. I mean, I think that's first and foremost above everything. That's what we care about here. I know from the school committee, we always talk about class size. We talk about getting teachers in the room and supporting them the best we can. And so very much appreciate all the years that everybody has given to our district, to our kids. So thank you all. You're here. Anybody else have any thoughts? Any and does any any of our honorees have any thoughts too? Yes. Uh, Julie Kopke has raised her hand. Mrs. Kopke, would you like to speak? I just wanted to wish everyone well. Um, much deserved, especially this past year and a half. And I'm so jealous, but I wish you well in your retirement. I see Dr. McKay also raised his hand. Dr. McKay. I want to congratulate everyone on their retirement and just to let everybody know how much I'm going to miss having Susan Hegarty. She was the reading special at the Hood School for 13 years, as well as my principal designee. Um, we were able to share some great stories at her retirement party on Friday. Um, and there's a project underway at the Hood School for a little outdoor classroom dedicated to, to Mrs. Hegarty, specifically <laughs> with the lending library. So feel free to stop by the Hood School and, and, and see the lending library in honor of Mrs. Hegarty. Excellent. 
I just wanted to thank um, Patrick and Michael for coming over to the Hood School the other day and, and giving me that beautiful bowl with engraving on it, honoring my 25 years in North Reading. And I also want to acknowledge um, Glenn for everything that he did for me with the Lending Library and the Reading Corner outside and just wonderful, wonderful tributes from all my colleagues. So I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Wayne. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. And uh, it's been wonderful to be in North Reading for 21 years. And um, the building that I've worked in, it's the greatest bunch of people that I've ever worked with in my life. They really are. And um, some of them I've worked with for over 20 years. And some of them I'm fortunate enough to call uh, my close friends. And that's the best measuring stick for anything anyway. And um, between North Reading and a dozen years and more in, in engineering before that, um, it's been a great ride. And um, I thank everybody uh, for everything that all their well wishes the last couple of weeks. And I will miss everybody. And um, it's, been, it's been great to work in, in North Reading. It, it, it's, it's been an honor and a privilege to work in such a great community with everybody. North Reading is the only professional place I've worked as a teacher. And, um, uh, and it's, it's, it's been awesome. So thank you all. Thank you, sir. Hi, um, this is Mary Staples from the high school. And I just wanted to say that, um, Coming to school every day has always been interesting, something new, never boring. And in the last couple of years, uh, the administration has been nothing less than amazing, it, you know, through this, through this pandemic challenge. And I've also been so impressed at how you've handled the changes and adjusted to a totally different way of doing your job. And it's been uh, a great run. And thank you so much for all of your well wishes. Thank you, Mary. Jean? Yes, I just wanted to say I will treasure the years at North Reading. Um, I started teaching in 1977 before computers. So here we are going out with remote learning, which is absolutely amazing to me. Um, I have treasured these years and thank you. Thank you, Jean. Okay. Well, this is usually where we get to take photos and give you the bowls, but apparently we don't. <laughs> do tonight, so. we take a snapshot of them. <laughs> now we, we we really appreciate all all your time, guys, and you know we always have them home here. And thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for your nice gift, and Patrick for coming and giving it to us individually. As well, thank you. Oh, said what? We put the substitute position for next year. Oh, good point. <laughs> point. Building sub if you want to be here. My plan okay. right now is to have no plan. <laughs> yes, no plans is good. Excellent. That is correct. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. And thank you. Okay. Now, I guess that's a good segue to we do want to keep some teachers in the district still. So the next thing is the NREA contract. Um, I guess I'll very quickly say that this was a very, very, very easy process. I, I give a lot of thanks to the people that negotiated this contract, in particular, Dr. Daly, Peter Kane, um, Shelly Kerrigan, uh, Liam, who, who was our attorney on our side, made this process a very, very easy process. Um, I don't know. I don't know what Mel and Jerry were complaining about. They said it was so hard all the time. I felt like everybody was very reasonable and easy to work with, and it went very well. So, you know, very proud to say, and, and, and thank Rich as well for doing it. I don't know if Rich, Patrick, do you have any thoughts before we go through the specifics? I mean, I'll just say that I agree with you. The process has been was pretty amazing. Uh, you know, for the most part, you and I were able to step out of the way and, and uh, let these guys work out uh, the details, and uh, uh, it was an excellent process. Um, it, it's been amazing the way uh, these negotiations by a remote hookup have, have been so smooth. So yeah. not not just that negotiation, but 
other contracts and the last summer's work as well. And probably the biggest fight in our <laughs> now it went it went really well. So appreciate all the work. Um, so after the negotiations, we were able to agree to a three-year contract, which will begin July 1st, 2021, just in the nick of time, um, and extend through June 30th, 2024. Cost of living adjustment will be 3%, two and a half, two and a half 2 and a half for the next three years. Uh, some other highlights, a revised curriculum, curriculum leadership stipend schedule will be instituted to provide greater equity across all three levels. Adjustments were made to the language to adjust for the start time changes at all levels. Updates were made to language for, for, for part-time educators and those working at multiple schools. And those are just some of the highlights, but you know, I, don't, I think overall it was a very collaborative effort and which was nice because when somebody brought up an issue, it seemed like the other side realized it was an issue that needed to be addressed as well. And so we kind of worked together to come to something that made sense for everybody. And so, and, and all the administrators that were on there, all the teachers that were part of the, part, part of the negotiation just made it very easy. So I thank everybody for that. Um, and if there's no other comments that we need to, and I, I know at the executive, we've talked about the financial piece along the way. So we've kind of, kind of been in agreement about that, but we would like to have a vote to approve the NREA contract for July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. I will move that the committee vote to approve the contract with the NREA that runs from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2024. I'll second. Okay, any comments, any discussion? Okay. I guess, well, yes, we're still remote. So I guess I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. And I am a very enthusiastic aye as well. So pass this five to zero. Thank you very much, everybody, for all the hard work. Um, congratulations. And thank you, Mr. Buckley and Mr. McGowan, for representing us. Thank you very much. It was an honor to the big bucks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> an honor to talk to the teachers and yep. see what they do. And Absolutely. And as, as somebody that's not an educator, it, it's nice to kind of see some of the issues that are being discussed and how everybody wants to work together to try to find solutions that, you know, better the district and make it, you know, make it so there's no ambiguity in what people should be doing. So very much appreciate it. So thank you all. And yeah. Dr. Daly? Something that's just come up due to uh, COVID, the, as we know, the athletic schedules are very different this year. Um, and there were some you know, adjustments made to, to the season and the length of the season. And what's come to our attention is that there, you know, the contract calls for a 5% leave. Um, is it 5% per week? 5% per week. Yeah. Okay. For, post, for participation in postseason play for coaches. And so you know, we, we believe that there was some uh, miscommunication through this process. With the, um, the, the seasons were already short, but everyone got paid 100%, and we, and we felt that they were all inclusive of postseason play. Uh, but it's been brought to our attention that, um, you know, certainly that, that is not the, the NREA's understanding, and that they, there would be an expectation of postseason play. The good news is um, we have several teams that are, that are competing far into the spring. Uh, Michael, you did a little more research today to find out that there's a couple of teams that are still playing right now. Yeah, I believe there's maybe all but maybe one team that up until this weekend is still competing. Um, I think there were two teams competing this evening, and then the team competing as far as you know, this weekend, based on how, how the games are going uh, you know, this week. Um, so, but, um, yeah, so there, 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 was a, there was an optional uh, postseason opt into a postseason tournament. Um, this year, you know, we the majority of the offering teams you know, off to participate. So certainly, that was a trajectory of the pandemic and the virus. It was certainly on a positive end at the end of the spring, so that the, the MIA was able to come, you know, go outside of what had been predominantly weak competition through the previous three seasons, the fall one, fall two, and then winter, uh, which was certainly a, a good thing for the opportunity for 
the student athletes to be able to get outside the league and compete um, against other teams in the state. So um, this was sort of a question that we had that we, the administration didn't necessarily anticipate. Um, the season length this, this year in terms of, um, you know, certainly the, the weeks because of the, the later start of the fall one season and the need to shift you know, those four sports into the, the fall too, and then other 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 sports that they in the winter also got shifted in, into the fall too. Um, certainly was um, a shorter season than what had been standard. Um, the the average season that each each athletic season went for both fall, winter, fall too um, was about an eight and a half to nine week season. If you look at the week, um, the spring this. Spring season began on April 26th, um, and here we are about June 21st. I think this is about the eighth, the eighth week. Um, I think the postseason competition of this tournament play, the MIA tournament play, could potentially push it through the weekend, which would be about a nine-week season. So it is, it is true that not, it's, it's still from in terms of the time commitment of what the, the coaches would do from a coaching standpoint from the start of the season. Through uh, this week, that is about a nine nine week commitment, which was similar to the fall, winter, and the fall two seasons. The, the winter season was a little bit shorter than maybe the the other three seasons, being at about seven seven week season, starting right after the holiday holiday season and running until about February February twentieth or so. Um, I think the big difference is um, that there was actually a tournament that they played, whereas the the other three seasons, it was sort of a, an attempt to run a, a caveman lead tournament at the end of the, the regular season competition. Um, and I think this leads to like, the, the caveman lead did a really good job kind of seeding teams and then running some type of a, of a competition beyond the regular season. It's just about all, all three previous seasons and then this spring, predominantly because of the trajectory of the virus, they have an not comfortable um, offering that. that that often postseason competition. So it's it's sort of that's led to the question of, of um, and does that constitute you know postseason compensation and, and this, it, should this week be the additional you know five percent of their of their each coach's standard stipend um, additional pay. Um, so I think that's the kind of the question I um, and I think um, that's what we're kind of would like to kind of discuss tonight. You know a, a typical season should everything have been kind of standard uh, without dates being shifted around, um, would run about a 12, 12 weeks or so, depending on the, the sport. Or, um, but you, you're at least looking at about a 10 week regular season. Some of the sports go a little bit longer, like football and fall, where it's certainly a, uh, close to that 12 week season um, before you would get into you know, a full season comp. Conversation situation. So we're certainly not quite at that that 10 to 12 week range, which we would think would be the typical, um, you know, regular season conversation under a standard season. Standard season. So nothing was obviously standard or, or typical this year. Um, so we kind of want to pose that question. We certainly want to see what's, what's right for all. And I think the most important thing that is that the students had opportunity to. Um, to compete, and um, that was that was the focus from from day one. I think both from the school, from the state band meeting, and from the MIA was that to to create certainly um, modifications to each season. Certainly, and there was more modifications early on based on the timing of it. But no one wanted to see what occurred last spring in a cancellation of ball sports. So we wanted to certainly have students have opportunity, and I think it was. Certainly exciting for all, certainly the students, especially, especially seniors, that both competing in their final spring season had the opportunity to have some level of postseason um, tournament, you know, competition. And um, you know, it's certainly that just about every athletic program, the head coaches and assistant coaches opted into that to provide the students with the opportunity. So that's the most important thing um, that we just wanted to pose. Question because it's just we haven't dealt with this obviously. This is kind of new territory. You know, does it does it constitute um, warranting the additional um, 
you know, receiving compensation for the NRDA contract agreement. So I, I, I personally am not. I, I don't feel strongly either way on this one, um, but I have a few questions just to kind of clarify. Number one, well, number number one, the three earlier seasons there was a tournament, a Cal League tournament afterwards. Were those coaches paid additional for those, or was that part of their? So there is no additional um, postseason compensation paid to any of the three previous seasons. Okay. Um, if if we paid for this one, would we then have to pay for those other three as well? So, I, or or do we think that it's distinct? Do we think that it's distinctively different that it's not a Cali tournament? I think, tournament the, I think the difference comes into um, the fact that this is technically you know tournament play when against other other you know towns outside of the Cape Finley, you know other towns throughout throughout the state. Um, whereas the previous um, seasons, it was pretty much a fixed a fixed. We knew the season was going to start on September 18th and end November 20th, starting January 4th and end February 20th. And you knew should everything, it was still a lot of uncertainty even within those weeks, but everything had gone well and there wasn't a lot of interruption due to post contacting and everything else, that there was going to be an attempt to run through the last two weeks after about a six to six, you know, seven week regular season of, of um, in league competition. To, to see some teams and run a tournament, but it was, it was the season was fixed. You know, when it was starting and ending, and it was just so that's a big difference. Yeah. Just off between the eight and nine weeks. And what's and what's the total cost we're talking about here? So you, based on um, it could be as much depending on how many how some teams probably do this week and how how things go. But we could be looking at as high of a cost as about fifty four hundred dollars, and, and it could be as low as. You know, four thousand. So we're in that four thousand to about fifty four hundred, fifty five hundred range as 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 a cost. So again, I think the the season, if you look at it just from a straight week, take aside what what it might have been league competition, Cape Man League tournament competition, league tournament competition, is not even with this full week involved going until let's say Monday, June twenty eighth, um, is not too different from a from a time commitment standpoint. It's just a level of competition or, or the state, what the state tournament and what the tournament is what's unique or different. And certainly from the from the um not you know, not your typical team season team the the the, 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 the spring girls and boys track, the difference is that they had the opportunity to go and compete at a class a class meet and then qualify and then go on to an all state meet. Uh, whereas in the winter and even the fall that was not not possible. There's no kind of MSTA, you know, class or state meet. And I, I do know that what a lot of the writing teams have done did really very, very well and the team is up to did very, very well in the class competition. Um, and then a lot of athletes qualify for their competing throughout this week is to be as, as late as Saturday. So so it seems to me the argument against it is the season even with the postseason is shorter than a typical season is or the same amount of time, and you're getting paid the full salary. The, the argument to pay it is compared to the other seasons, it's longer than the other seasons were. And I would argue that when they agreed to it beforehand, there was no anticipation necessarily of having a tournament. And that was something that came up later on. Wow. And to me, I mean, my personal opinion is I would defer to you guys sort of on what you guys want to do because I don't feel strongly either way about it. But yeah. you know, what, what would what would your suggestions be, Patrick and Michael? So, our original suggestion, we felt that you know, we didn't prorate the season, we kind of paid, you know, it was all inclusive. Um, we thought that that had been communicated. I think it, it was not clear. It's not anything that we put in the MOU. We did put specific language in the MOU about other things this year. Again, that was back when we didn't know we were going to be playing sports. Uh, we did kind of reconvene and put that in there. The NREA did reach out to us today, did not make mention of any other season. It was really about the spring season in particular. And uh, I think I would, at this stage, given all that's going on and that you know the coaches are out there right now doing this with the kids, Although I do think that they have been compensated for that amount of time, I think that I would recommend that we 
before it gets to the TV. Michael was yeah, trying to see the TV. I'm kind of thinking, thinking through it with that um, lens. In the, in, um, the fact that the season was a little bit different, the fact that there was a tournament play, and we're, we're glad that all coaches, even if it wasn't an often, often to do that, we always provide students with that opportunity. So it was. It was that different aspect to it. I, I think you know, compensating this additional week for that for that type of play, but just maybe capping that at the five percent um, of their stipend for that additional compensation to carry them through this week, and hopefully the team do well and they will continue on into, into the weekend. Um, would be sort of a, a fair approach to the way to the way we look at it. So that it, those those teams competing, they would get five five percent of their stipend, but maybe no 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 option to get more than that. Uh, the committee. Um, I see the the logic of what you're saying, and then you know obviously I don't, I don't think any of us have seen any of the numbers, so feasibility is entirely up to what, what you tell us that it is in terms of how much money there is. But although. That seems like a fair compromise. If if the idea at the root is that there was a misunderstanding and they had reason to believe that they would be entitled to tournament pay at the end of the season, then it seems unfair if we agree with that logic to then not only pay one week and then if they make it to two more weeks, not pay that. I appreciate that. I don't know what's feasible. I don't know. Where things shake out, but if we're gonna if we're gonna say that that's a fair argument on the teachers on the coach's behalf, then I, I feel weird about them limiting things. Well, the ar argument also could be if the contract typically provides for it, and the MOU changes the contract, and it wasn't clearly changed, right? Then you go back to what the original contract said, right? I feel like that's where we're at. Which but yeah, now. now I mean, and I also say, and again, not can't stress enough that I haven't seen the numbers on it, but mathematically, it's if there's anybody that makes it a second or a third week, this will drop down how much each extra week costs us, right? Because it's not like it's limited to 15. It's limited, yeah. And, and it's limited in, in terms of number of people. Because but, not but you know, going it, forward, yeah. uh, crossing my fingers to the opposite, it's mm -hmm. you know unlikely that every team makes it to the next week. You know, it, it, it shrinks down. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's uh, I, I think I don't know how my understanding is that the team is not going to carry on beyond June 30th. So I don't uh, even know. So it's right. moved. That was my understanding from the beginning. I'm not 100%. I love to have this Jonathan here, but right. he wasn't able to attend. So somebody just came up this afternoon. Championship games are scheduled for July 3rd. For July 3rd, okay. right? And, and I originally heard that nothing was going to go beyond June 30th. And your number of 4,000 to 5,500 is for one week? The 5,400 is one week. That's one, okay, that's and one week. Assuming every week. week was here. At maximum. This week at the maximum, I don't, I don't have that exact breakdown. Okay, yeah, but that wasn't looking for two or three weeks. Time. That was just one week. Correct. Okay. So there's a, there's a chance that some could go beyond if, if we look at you know June right. 18th or 20th as being the cutoff of the regular season. That if, if someone needs to go to July 3rd, it could carry into that second week. Oh, somewhat of oh, this. Well, if it goes into July 3rd, does that then come out of next year's budget, not this year's? Just that curiosity. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yes. After well, any any of those funds would presumably be easier to figure out than correct. Coming so back. That's definitely tight, and you'll see in the budget update later. Yeah. And, we're, and we do that normally, and we add to, of course. to this year. So. Speaking for me, I can appreciate what Dr. Daly and what Michael are are, are saying. Um, if that you guys had it in your head that it's a shorter that it's a short season, and that like that makes sense to me, but if if that genuinely wasn't communicated in such a way that the teachers or the coaches really got that understanding out of it, if they went into this reasonably feeling like standard rules apply as far as term in place, then I feel like we're obligated to, to honor that. I don't agree. Janine, Diana, thoughts? We'll bring that forward back if we run into a financial issue then I think we would meet with the NRA and see if we can reach a compromise but otherwise we try to okay yeah we can we'll, we can we'll figure it out right? yeah. okay so I'm trying to like yeah. here and there we'll, we'll, we'll get the <coughs> yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. And again, we, we know that it was a odd year overall, but yep. I think also just making sure that we fix the communication lapses at times, make sure that those are, if, if it comes up again, something next, like this. Next that pandemic. We're, next pandemic. Yeah. Well, or, or again, I mean, anything, anything like this, like if it's communicated through certain positions that those people are being clear with, with the people, because if it has to come from Dr. Daly or from the school committee, it's just important to make sure that it's getting to the right people. That message is not being missed. So, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We have all the principals sitting here, so I believe it's school improvement plan day. So, you ready to go to that, or do you want to? Yeah, just, just for the sake of time, should we just quickly do the um, trip? Is that one of the Yeah, we can do a couple. Of, the other thing I was thinking is at the end, just so people on the meeting know, we have to go with the select board at 8:30, and I think worst comes to worst, we can always just go to the select board, come back, and yeah, finish up the last couple of things if we need to. Yeah. But um, is Mrs. K is Mrs. Kane on here? Yeah. Let's try to get through. Yeah. Well, we're we're, we're going to try to get through it either way. You want you want to do? Um, I just thought if we did that one quickly, then some people would want to hear that. I think. So we can skip right to a motion on the on the yeah form. yeah we we, we talked about that. unless there's been any yeah. changes I move that we vote to approve the uh, uh, NRPS performing arts trip uh, for twenty for 2022 that was communicated to us last meeting. I second. Okay. Any more discussion on it? Okay. Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. I'm an I as well. Five zero. Thank you. Okay. Have fun. Good for school improvement plans. Okay, we're going to start with the elementary. Do you have an order you want to go in, Dr. Daly? I would, I would recommend starting with elementary. Yep. Um, and then, and then go to okay. Do we have volunteers to start, or do we? Is, is it like I get to the teacher and pick on the uh, principals? <laughs> well, I'll, I think I'll start I, if somebody puts the presentation up. <laughs> okay. Mrs. So the, Molly. New drew, the, the new guy drew the straw, uh, the short straw. So I'm going to try and present the the join joint presentation from the elementary principals. Okay, you're gonna do joint one for all of them. And at the end, just to be clear, I think we should, we can do some general comments. There might be some specific because I do think that there might be different needs at different schools. And so just, there might be some specific questions and we might vote. I think we should vote to improve each, approve each of them separately, just to be clear. Cool. Yes, at the end. Okay. We can hear one presentation rather than, because they are very similar. Yeah. Great, I got all that. <laughs> We're done. We're done. Motion, motion to approve. <laughs> <laughs> and Rich, that was backwards, so that's even more. That was under, that's great. I do, I do better backwards. That's how you think. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody. Um, we're excited to be here. It's it's really hard to believe that a year has gone by since we presented our last school improvement plan to you and what a year it's been. Um, before we get into the nuts and bolts of the three plans, um, I'd like to extend my sincerest appreciation to the school committee and to Dr. Daly, Mike Conley, Sean Colleen um, for all of the support we got this year. Um, you know, in the good times and the bad times when we we were really struggling at times, we knew that we had that people had our backs and that, um, you know, we appreciate that more than, you know. So thank you for that. Thank you for always being there for us and supporting everything we do. We appreciate it. Um, tonight, Dr. McKay and Mr. Maloney and I will be presenting our school improvement plans. They are similar but different. Um, We've tried to incorporate a little bit, a little bit more data this year, and um, tried to make things a little bit more visual. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think you are in receipt of our full school improvement plans. I think Dr. Daly probably, I'm hoping, has given those to you in advance. So if you have any questions, you can certainly ask us at the end of the presentation. So um, on our cover, you see some recent pictures. 
uh, of uh, the three schools. Um, although I think Mr. Maloney um, wanted to keep Mr. Um, Colleen in the Batchelder picture because he felt as though he was a big part of the Batchelder school this year. The picture from the little school is the graduating, the fifth grade graduating class, uh, the drone photo that we had taken. And Dr. McKay, I'm not sure I see Officer Lucci there, so maybe you can explain what that picture is on the cover. That's a picture of um, a citizenship award being give, given to a student who was safe, responsible, and respectful in a very um, difficult time. He did a great job, and I wanted to just, that was one of those highlights of the year for us, so Officer Lucci came, and we met, we gave him a little certificate, and I thought it was a great little picture at the front of the school, and I love the tree in the background, and then I'll share a little bit about the picture that I put on the opening slide for mine as well. Great. Mr. Maloney, there you go. So at the little school, I'd like to um, reach out. I think uh, one of my members is actually um, on tonight. She, I think I saw her log on. So I'd like to thank the school council members, Linda Emery, Kerry Fleck, Katie Gabriello, uh, Christopher Tedro. And once again, I was so close to having a community representative, but it just didn't work out in the final hour last fall. So I'm already, I'm already searching for my community rep for this coming year. Um, I'm hoping to have a little bit more success with it this year than I have had in the last two years. So um, next, Mr. Maloney. The, um, some of the highlights for the little school this past year, many of them you are very aware of, but just to recap, um, you'll be seeing our end of the year iReady results. As you recall, we did not have MCAS data last year, so we opted to go with iReady data to measure student uh, progress and growth. So we are happy to show you a tremendous amount of student growth in spite of the hybrid learning model. Um, we had some conversations at the faculty level about why we thought the numbers looked as good as they did, because we were pretty fearful of what the numbers were going to look like. And, and, and it was an interesting conversation because the teachers felt as though, you know, the, having less kids in the classroom, obviously half the time, and also an interesting um, suggestion was that we had very few interruptions this year, no, no real field trips, less enrichment programs, um, uh, you know, less um, instrumental music, kids getting pulled out for instrumental music and chorus and things like that. So there was actually, the, the teachers felt they actually had more interrupted, less, more uninterrupted teaching time in the classroom because there were less interruptions. So I thought that was an interesting take. Um, obviously, you know that the buildings were upgraded with um, multiple um, safety um, improvements, air purifiers, water bottle filling stations, top of the line air, air filters, hand sanitizing stations, the outdoor tents, the backpack spray units for the custodians and and et cetera. There were many, many things that were put in place this year and we thank you for all of that. Um, our, our wonderful PTO purchased indoor recess kits for every student in the school, pre-K to grade five. These were small plastic um, containers that included age appropriate um, manipulatives and activities for the children to use during recess and they were a big hit at all grade levels. The children got to take the contents of those kits home at the end of the year, and we kept the bins. God forbid we ever need to do it again, um, because we're you know, hopefully never going to be in this situation again, but we, um, we were happy to send those, the, the contents of those recess kits home with the students. Um, we were excited that we very early on in the year, we received a parent donation, um, which was put towards two new smart boards in the fifth grade classrooms. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the year, we had additional budgetary and grant funding for an additional eight smart boards in the building. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, technology um, changes all the time. And most of the boards that we have are now well, God, they've got to be close to 15 years old and um, they're becoming obsolete. So we were very excited to be able to start to replace many of those smart boards. And it all got kicked off with that uh, donation from an anonymous parent. They chose to keep their name um, anonymous and we are very appreciative for their, their generosity. 
And as you know, all students in grades K to five received Chromebooks this year. And I have to say, I am amazed at how well the children did with the Chromebooks. I mean, in the beginning, I'm not gonna lie, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, it was pretty sketchy there in the beginning, but they've come a very long way and um, it, it was very exciting to witness. And lastly, we were actually proud of the fact that we began pool testing in late February and we had a, an extremely high, what we felt and what the, what the nurses felt was a very high participation rate more than 40% of the students and 57% of the, the adults were pool tested weekly. Um, and we had we didn't have one positive result. It was negative. They were all negative from, from February. So we were very excited about that. Mr. Maloney. So for three, the three elementary schools, and I included this at the front of the presentation, we could have actually put this at the batch or at the hood, but our goals this year were to, for um, in I using iReady as our data um, collection tool and, and in the areas of ELA and math, our goal was to have 80% of our students in tier one, tier one is on or above grade level, 15% uh, at tier two, which is one grade level below, and tier three, 5%, which is two or more levels below. So that was our goal for the year. And that was at all three elementary schools. I apologize, this looks a little busy, but I met with my data leader and she impressed upon me how important it was to show where we began the year and where we ended the year. So for iReady in ELA at the little school, um, only grades three to five use iReady for, for ELA assessment. So as you can see, we bro I broke it out by grade three, grade four, and grade five. BOI is beginning of the year, EOI is end of the year. And so you can see that, you know, there were some pretty um, big numbers in tier three. In grade three, there were 10% at the beginning of the year, and we ended the year at 0% in tier three. Um, relatively high numbers in tier one to begin with, but 71% in tier three, I mean, in grade three, 61% we started the year in grade four, 57 in grade five. Um, but taking grade five, for an example, we started with 57% of the children in tier one, and we ended the year with 81% of the children in tier one. And then I looked at the whole school, the combination of grades three to five, and those are our beginning of the year numbers versus our end of the year numbers. So we ended the year with 83% of the grades three to five students in tier one, 16%, we just missed that 15% um, goal, and 1% in tier three, which was significantly lower than we had anticipated. So, uh, you know, we, we had anticipated it would be closer to 5%. So we were excited about the 1%. In math, it's a little bit more difficult to um, do the whole school number because that the whole school number includes all of kindergarten, grade one, and grade two, in addition to grades three and five. So again, I broke out the numbers for grades three, four, and five so that you can see the improvements from the beginning of the year. We ended the year in grades three, four, and five with no children in tier three. Um, I, I'm not quite in, I'm, in the 1% at the whole school because again, that included kindergarten, grade one, and grade two numbers. So we ended um, the year in math, 84% uh, of our children in tier one, 16%, just missing that 15% goal again um, in tier two and 1% in tier three. This is what it looks like visually, just so you can get an idea of what those, those triangles mean with the tiers. It's the same information you just saw, 83%, 16%, and 1% in tier three for ELA, and very similar um, numbers for math, K to five, 84% in tier one, 16% in tier two, and 1% in tier three. So we looked at, uh, Mr. Maloney and I, and Mr. McKay will talk to you about his goals, but he was a little bit further along with the development of his goals than Mr. Maloney and I were. So we looked at our goals and we decided we had achieved the 80% in tier one, so we were going to stretch our goals a little bit. So for our ELA and our math, we're stretching to 
in um, tier one, 13 percent in tier two and two percent in tier three. Obviously, every year is a different year. We get a new cohort of children come through. Um, and we felt in a more traditional year, we wanted to, I was, I was toying with the idea of even pushing it a little bit further, but um, with not knowing what this next traditional year will look like, um, I thought that going to 85% for tier one and, and the following numbers were appropriate. Um, the third goal, th those are the first two goals, teaching and learning for ELA and math. The third goal is management and operations. So we wanted to make our goals a little bit more measurable. Um, and, you know, the teaching and learning goals are easily measurable because we have assessments to measure and, and, and we can do the data and all of that. For the next three goals, we decided that the best way for us to measure success and growth would be through surveys. So for our management and operation goal, um, we're going to improve the percentage of students reporting that the school is emotionally and physically safe and conducive to learning. This will involve a survey, a student survey that looks at social emotional learning and, and, and um, you know, their perspective on if the school is um, physically safe and so forth. So that target will be 80 percent um, that children are feeling that, you know, that, that the environment is emotionally, physically safe and conducive to learning. Um, goal number four for family and community engagement. We'd like to improve the percentage of parents and guardians and or other family members reporting that they engage in regular two-way meaningful communication about student learning with teachers and other school staff. I think we do a very nice job of communicating. I know myself, I, I sent a weekly email out every Sunday. I send monthly calendars. I you know, would send periodic emails when they needed to go out. Um, we we use Twitter as as a as a mode of communication, but I think we looked at maybe improving the two way communication, and some of that will include you know maybe having monthly or bi monthly um, coffee hours or virtual meetings with families to talk about important issues going on or to answer questions that parents and guardians may have. So again, this will be measured by a parent or family survey, um, most likely one in the fall to give a baseline and then another one in the spring. And then um, our professional culture goal will be to uh, build con uh, cultural competency across all faculty and staff, working to identify, explore, and increase the understanding of what cultural competency means in the school environment and to support a positive school climate and culture. This will be measured by a staff survey. So that'll, that'll be done also in the fall and the spring. And some of the focus areas in a nutshell for the coming year is, I'd like to reduce by the end of the year, the number of students in tier two for ELA and math while increasing the numbers of students in tier one. Um, we'll, we'll use data-driven decisions to guide su support and interventions to support student learning and to measure progress. And this includes looking at regression due to COVID and or some, the typical summer regression. Uh, to create a culturally responsible, responsive, equitable, and safe learning environment through the expansion of UDL in the classroom, which we've been um, little by little expanding over the last couple of years, but I'd like to get more faculty involved in that. And to improve the two-way communication between parents and families through virtual office hours, expanded use of social media, and the reinstatement of in-school parent volunteers, which I have to say we, we miss having the parents in the building so much, so we're looking forward to that. Um, and then finally, to promote the continued professional development and the continuation of the educator evaluation goals in the area of social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that, I believe, does it for the little school. I think we're going to Dr. McKay at this point. Thank you, Mrs. Molly. Um, I just wanted to echo the sentiments that you, you sent out to, to Dr. Daly, Mr. Colleen, Mr. Um, Conley, as well as the committee, and thank them for all their support this year. But I also I want to thank you and Sean for the first half of the year, and Michael for the second half of the year. It was certainly a challenging year, and a in, 
and we keep saying global pandemic, but it was a challenge and I, I couldn't have made it through without you successfully. So thank you, Michael. And thank you, Chris, for all your help this year. I thought it was a great year considering all the variables that we were presented. I also want to say thank you to my school council members. So I had um, Mrs. Blanchett, the school nurse, Mrs. Riesenberg was our community representative. Um, Ms. Kelly was another faculty member, as well as I had Mrs. Catarano and Mrs. Burnham as my parent reps. And, and I love that first picture. That's the dedication of um, the lending library to Mrs. Hegarty on the front page of this. And that's actually the, the, the children of my members of my, my school council. So just a little special thank you to them right there. Um, it was a very nice year. So we were happy to get through and get through successfully. Michael, if you could click to the next slide. So highlights were similar to the little school around the COVID related building upgrades. Um, one item that, that came through um, in school council was a parent forum. We ended up sending out um, a survey for some questions. Parents fully responded to what they needed, what like information that they basically needed to you know, understand what was going on within the school. It became quick to, for me to understand. There's probably about like 50 different domains. So we basically recorded a video um, and sent that out to all the parents basically in response to their questions. And, you know, we took them for video tours of physical spaces that they were questioning because we have to remember that parents weren't even allowed in the building. So they were probably wondering, what does the cafeteria look like? What does eating in the gymnasium look like? So we wanted to give them that special glimpse of that. So that was a definite highlight for us. And, you know, the school council lane that it went through was very appropriate so it felt good to actually utilize that mechanism we did focus a lot on school climate and specifically staff and student well-being we had school-wide meetings i usually tally them up um, we were able to utilize the wednesdays to do school-wide read-alouds on a specific topic so that was really exciting we did a bunch this year and we really focused on a specific kindness skill each time um, and we were happy to really you know reset everybody and understand that what was really important at that moment in time throughout a year that we were actually together and functioning within a building we had our kindness rock garden dedication um all students in grades k through five received the chromebooks we were able to participate in the yale research study and we maintained positive relationship offering school-wide enrichment during hybrid learning so we were we were able to just change how we do business we basically have different presenters come in virtually and present and in a school-wide manner. So it was fun experimenting with that. There was definitely some challenges when, um, you know, a connection would go bad or there'd be an overload of a number, a certain number of students on the screen, but it was all in good fun. And we were able to, you know, offer some nice enrichments for our students in a school-wide manner through the virtual option. Next slide. So I'm, I apologize. This came out a little bit grainy and you'll see on the next slide. Basically, this, this relates to um, that goal number one, where we want 80% of our students in tier one, 15% of our students in tier two, um, and 5% in that tier three. For us at the Hood School, um, for tier one, across ELA and math in grades three, four, and five, three out of six categories met that tier one category. Um, so grade four math met that, grade five missed that by 1%, they're at 79 in math, and grade three, we have to really focus on some grade three math and move those students. We had a very high number in tier two that we really need to move to that 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 tier one. In ELA, grades three through grades three and five met that goal. And in grade four, we did not. So we have definitely have some work, but then we were able to reflect and say, okay, we were in a pandemic year and we're pretty close on all categories. And the beautiful thing about iReady is that it gives us an opportunity to really dissect that data and see where our growth opportunities are. So for us, we, we still have that global overall struggle. Where we need to focus specifically on geometry. Next slide. So overall placement for the whole school, we were, we were excited to, to say that in grades three through five in reading, 80% of our students are in tier one when it's all combined. So this is a combined school, 17% in tier two, and then at risk is tier three, and that's 4% for reading. Next slide. And then the math. So this is this is where our little struggle continues to be is that tier one is at 70%, that tier two is at 26%, and then we maintain that 4% at tier three. So it's how do we really analyze the data? It 
it appears to me just really spending some time with the data leader that's geometry and move children from that tier two to that tier one score. Um, so as Chris Molly had said that we typically standardize our goals um, across the three elementary schools. I, I run my meetings and Mrs. Embriano will tell you as, as a former member of the Hood School Council that I, I, I'm, I start off the first year focusing on goal four at, at the first meeting and then I work my way backwards um, when I do those meetings. So what that did is that created, as Mrs. Molly and Mr. Maloney worked on their goals on the other end of the school year, that created, I had already met with my council on, on all my goals. So I didn't have time to adjust them in real time. So I am kept my goals similar to I had, as I had them in the past year, but they'll definitely shift forward to more align with the other two schools in the following year. So again, we have that 80% threshold in tier one. Um, that we want to continue to to maintain in both ELA and math, and then we have the tier two at 15% and tier three um, at the other five percent. So we kept that 80% threshold, but uh, definitely as we work through the year, continue to work with Mrs. Molly and, and Mr. Maloney to, to standardize that. And when I report out next year, I'll make sure that I report out in conjunction with them. Next slide, please. So we continue to focus on teaching and learning. We continue to talk about best practices at the Hood School. We spend a lot of time talking about individual students and meeting the needs of diverse learners. We really talk a lot about how we use data and what data we use to impact learning outcomes. And again, with, with the co-taught model or what we call push-in service delivery is our professionals are pushed into the general education classroom to the degree to which it's appropriate to meet student needs. So we're gonna continue all those practices going forward. Next slide. Management and operation, operations is basically to, sub, to provide a safe learning environment for all students. Um, this year, as you know, that we had our community-wide SRR meetings, our safe, responsible, and respectful meetings. We really need to get back on focusing on the high, wide, high five wall of fame and rewarding children for being caught safe, responsible, and respectful. And as we analyze the data from the year research study, we're, we're going to expand SRR into other categories. We just don't know what they are yet until we get that data. Mr. Maloney, next slide. So family and community engagement. It, I, I love that the goal that Mrs. Maloney and Mr. Maloney put in place, that, that improvement of two-way communication. So obviously family and community engagement is about engaging stakeholder groups and families. And I put out that we're going to do the virtual office hours this year and we're going to really focus on expanding use of Twitter um, and have vo parent volunteers back to the degree to which they that we're allowed to. Next slide, please. Professional culture. We we've pro always been proud of our philosophy of hand in hand together. We can meaning that we work together. We learn together and we get better together. So our focus area will be continued with our faculty study groups on various topics. This year, we focused on social emotional learning, school, um, climate, teaching tolerance, math instruction, and arts integration. Um, this upcoming year, in light of many of us participating in what's called the science of reading, um, we've had an opportunity to already start to put together a professional learning community relative to that and focus on our we call it our RTI model in the morning. I know that we're, we're moving to um, MTSS and we'll be looking at the middle school model for that, um, but definitely to see how that science of reading plays into breaking students up into smaller groups and work with them on individual needs. So our focus areas continue to be really moving students into that tier one with the goal that 80% of all students being in tier one. This year, we, we almost got there, but almost, isn't really good enough and we need to get better at that. Um, we want to continue to use data-driven decisions um, to learn, to measure student learning progress. We want to utilize the data from the Yale research study as a means to improve student well-being and improve recess. It was interesting, a takeaway as, as we came back, we had, you know, some, some difficulties out at recess. And basically I, I, I really stepped back from it. I went out and watched and, and, Many of we have to remember and reflect that these are our youngest learners and a lot of them were in a lockdown mentality and they couldn't go out and they couldn't play with peers. So we really think that we need to spend some of that quality time as 
teaching what recess really looks like and, and how to in, interact appropriately. Um, it's definitely not an individual student fault. It's, it's, there's a growth opportunity for everyone in that. And that's going to be one of our, our major takeaways. So the Yale research study data will definitely help us with that. Um, we really want to continue to focus on creating a culturally responsive and equitable learning environment by using UDL. We want to improve that two-way parent communication and promote continued professional development in social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And that is you, Mr. Maloney. Thank you, Dr. McKay. Um, you. <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to also say thank you uh, to the school committee uh, for your time tonight to present the school improvement plan. This is my first crack at this, so please bear with me and, and be patient and kind. Uh, I'd like to thank Patrick uh, for the opportunity to be the principal uh, at the Bachelor School and also the school committee for agreeing with him. Uh, Michael Conley, um, you know, all my questions about all things budget and finance, uh, where Kathy used to take care of all that stuff uh, with you, now I have to learn how to do that. Um, and with all the budget requests that I have for next school year, you might see my name on your, your phone quite a bit coming up. Uh, and especially Sean Clean. Um, I left your picture up there, Sean, on purpose because uh, I think I said to Chris Molly today, you can either take uh, half the credit or half the blame. So I think we can share <laughs> share the, the progress this year or the blame, which, whichever uh, side of the, the tracks that, that may fall. But I want to thank you for all your, your time and answering all my questions and, and your guidance and, and mentorship um, this past six months. And, and also to, to Glenn and Chris, um, you know, for all your help and, and support uh, in the process, just the day in and day out uh, items that I've had to call you and and ask you for your your wealth of experience uh, and guidance. So I do I very much appreciate all of that, um, that time that, that you have given. And to my school council members, uh, who I met the first week in, in December, uh, along with Sean's help, uh, we, we co-ran the first couple meetings. Um, and I'd like to say a special thank you to Kate Arniz, uh, who's the parent representative, Catherine Fay, who is second grade teacher, faculty representative, uh, Carrie Eichmann, who was new this year to the to the school council for, for her help and, and support. Marianne Late was our community rep and Sandra O'Connell was my other faculty representative. So I want to thank them for their time and giving me the, I think the, the time to adjust to that learning curve, being a part of the middle school um, council at times, but not really having had to run it. So I appreciate their flexibility with me and in, in, in my learning curve and in, in running this process. So thank you. Um, the well, I switch screens here. So before I, I, I speak to the highlights, I just want to, I guess, speak a little bit to the process of, of the school improvement plan and what I've learned and, you know, in my conversations with Dr. Daly about really you know, that, that idea of, and I, that's what I've come to, and I've said it a few times over the last few weeks working on the plan, it's, you know, it's everybody pulling on the rope in the same direction uh, to, to get things where they, they need to be and really connecting the dots on, on aligning the goals from the district goals to the school goals to the principal goals down to the, the, the teacher goals. And, and if we're all working towards the same goal, it, it, it's going to make the work a little bit easier, which, you know, I appreciate Glenn and Chris helping me write these goals. And, you know, we're all working for the same thing is to prepare the, you know, our youngest learners to prepare them to be successful in middle school and middle school job is to, to prepare them so they can be successful in high school. And, you know, our, our district goal, including the high school, is for them to become productive citizens in the 21st century, which aligns to our, our mission and vision. So, Really, that that alignment piece. I'm I'm looking forward to really doing more with that, and you know that backwards design. Where do we want the district to be, or where do we want our kids to be, and, and, and how do we get there? And I think that speaks to Patrick's, you know, vision for 2025, and the, you know that initiative and the event that he's running tomorrow, and the, the input from our, our stakeholders um, throughout the district. I think is important. Um, but enough of that. Uh, so highlights from 2021. Um, Students were welcomed back to a building that was a safe and healthy place for high quality teaching and learning to take place. Um, 
really, you know, I was able to observe both schools, the middle school, and then when I get down to the bachelor school, the, the schools really were safe and healthy. And, you know, Chris spoke to the pool testing, and I think our number was anywhere between 105 to 115 faculty and staff tested uh, on, on Monday mornings. And, you know, with, with Ms. Resker and Ms. Steele helping, we, we really got through that, and the kids were great, and, you know, happy to report that we also didn't have any positive cases as a result of uh, pool testing. So that was really a highlight. Um, you'll see in the data just shortly that, you know, 90% of our students in grades two through five scored in tier one, which is on or above grade level. Um, we had only 8% of students in tier two uh, and only 2% of our students scored in tier three based on end of year ELA literacy and iReady data. Um, so I guess that's some of the some of the credit, Sean, that you're going to share on that. So, uh, but really, all the all the credit goes to to the educators in the building, uh, and across the district. It, it's really impressive what the data does show, uh, the work that they did. You know, starting I guess back in March of 2000 and 20 seems like a really long time, but you know the, the mid-year data looked okay, but the end of the year data looked looked great, and we're really looking forward to what those MCAS scores. Uh, hopefully positively will show us. Uh, in math, uh, which is K through five, we had 88% of the students uh, score in tier one, 11% uh, in tier two, and, and only 1% of students scoring uh, in that, that tier three. Um, the district, you know, I was really impressed with the UDL um, and the social emotional initiatives at, at the batch. Um, very involved, very engaged teachers that, um, you know, we had Emily Pat come in and, and present it's more of like a, a share out of the work that, that our, our faculty did this year on UDL and, you know, some, some work products. I think it's the, uh, our presentation to the school committee. We had some of the same teachers uh, show this, the student work from, from the UDL initiative and, and really that social emotional piece um, where students felt safe and, and, and felt connected to the school, whether they were in, in the building or at home. So, really impressed with that and it's really a highlight um, from the building uh, and lastly the entire school community warmly welcomed the new principal on december 1st and, and supported that transition with all of the help guidance and the patience that was necessary um, and i really do need to thank and i and i have said this in person and i'd like to say it publicly now thank all the, the students the teachers the staff at the bachelor of the school for being so welcoming and kind and patient um, you know with that transition and it's really been a joy uh, of 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 mine, you know, since December, uh, how warmly welcomed I was at the batch, and you know, really being a part of the success of, of the building that you know Sean built, and, and hopefully continue that success uh, moving forward. So those were the highlights. Um, so looking at you know the performance based on you know the 2021 goal. So in in reading. Uh, and at the Bachelor of the School, we, we include the second graders in our reading. And I'm not sure if you can see the, the shadowed out part um, really well, but it shows that window one shows our beginning of the year um, scores. Um, and, and on the left is the end of the year. So with reading grades two through five, we ended the year in, with 90% of our students in, in tier one. And at the start of the year, it's actually blurry for me too, and I wish I had the paper in front of me. But I believe it was fifteen. Only fifty-nine percent of students uh, were in tier one, so that's uh, you know a pretty significant increase. Uh, we we started the year with thirty-four yeah. percent. Mr. Maloney, we uh, lost your audio just one sec. If you want to hold on. Okay. Can you hear me now? Hear me now. Okay. Um, just going back to the to the presentation. So, uh, in grades two through five in reading, uh, tier one, we started the year at fifty eight percent. I'm sorry, it was fifty eight percent of students scoring in that tier one window, and at the end of the year it was ninety percent. And I, I hopefully you can see the graphic. Uh, the shadowed out part is is window one, and you can see how the green is a little bit smaller then the end of year, the yellow is a little bit bigger and the red is significantly bigger from the start of the year to the end of the year. Uh, tier two at the, at the beginning of the year, there was 34% of students in tier two um, and we reduced that down to 9%. 
and then at risk, um, that beginning of the year data showed that 7% uh, of the students, uh, grades two through five were in tier three, uh, and we re reduced that down to 1%. So um, significant improvement from that window one, that, that beginning of the year uh, data to the, to the end of the year data. And in math, can get grades K through five, uh, beginning of the year. Again, I think if if you can see this this graphic, this really shows how you know that the the, the strong visual of the green beginning of the year is thirty nine percent of students in math um, scored in tier one, and there was an increase to eighty eight percent by the end of the school year. Fifty seven percent of students were in tier two, and there was a reduction down to eleven. And again, tier three. At the beginning of the year, it was 5% and only 1% at the end of the year. So really significant growth. And I, I have to take credit, Ms. Ms. Callanan, uh, Suzanne Callanan, our, our data specialist in, in our academic convention, has put this together for me. She actually sent a newsletter out to, to all the faculty, just congratulating them on all the work. And, you know, I think in there, she says it really does take a village. And it's, you know, support support staff, the paraprofessionals, you know, special education teachers, regular education teachers who really were all pulling on that rope in the same direction to get the students to, to the levels um, where they are now at, at the end of the year and, you know, meeting all those targets from last year's goal. So very proud of the work that our teachers and our students accomplished. So for this school year, uh, I'm sorry, for next school year, 2021-2022, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to the uh, approval part it's quicker than <laughs> I should. Um, so again, very similar to, to Ms. Molly's goals. Uh, ELA and literacy, our target um, range is 85% of students will score in Tier 1. Uh, we'll get that Tier 2 down to 10%, and 5% uh, or fewer will score in the Tier 3 for from reading in math it's the same targets 85 10 and 5 um, based on the the, the i ready based on from the beginning of the year to the end of the year um, our third school goal at 80 percent of students will report that the bachelor of the school is emotionally and physically safe and conducive to learning um, 80 percent of parents Guardians and or other family members will report that they have an opportunity to participate in regular two-way meaningful communication about student learning with teachers and other school staff. And I know Ms. Molly talked about, you know, parents with um, coffee hours and, and virtual presentations and those types of things, but something specific that we did talk about, you know, we talked about sharing student data and using student data. And um, we talked about specifically iReady scores and, you know, the difference between the beginning of the year scores, mid-year scores, and, and end-of-year scores. And iReady, as you may or may not know, it's, it's assessing whether or not students are on or above or below grade level. And if, you know, sharing student data, if, if we sent those scores home at the beginning of the year without any explanation or opportunity for two-way communication, and a parent saw that their, their student was scoring you know, one grade below where they should be um, without any explanation. Yes, you can give them a handout on how to read the, the data, but having an opportunity to discuss the data and what we're using it for and where we want it to be, that's a specific example of how we see that two-way communication enhancing, um, you know, parents, guardians, whomever, their understanding of the teaching and learning process and, and how we use that data. So that's just one specific example about how if we share student data, and with parents, that two-way communication back and forth um, will, will allow them to be better informed about that process. And lastly, our last goal um, is work with faculty and staff to identify, explore, and increase understanding of cultural competency in the school environment to support a positive learning school climate and culture. And that speaks to, you know, the work that we're doing around diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, and, and social justice. Um, you know, again, aligning with, with the, the district's goals. Focus areas are the same. You know, it's to reduce the amount of students in Tier 2 while we're increasing our students in Tier 1, using data to drive all our decisions, you know, identifying supports that students might need, interventions that they might need, um, continuing with the expansion of UDL in the classroom, uh, um, taking a, a professional development over the 
over the summer. Um, Katie Novak in, in, in their book, it's UDL, um, in terms of equity and, and social justice, I, I forget the name of the, the title of the book, uh, improving that two-way communication with parents and continued professional development of all educators around social justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I think that's it. I hope I, I did all right in my first crack at this. <laughs> I'll have to call Kathy O'Connell later to, to get the real truth, so. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for your support. That's our, our last slide. So we really do thank you for all your support. Scott, you're, mute. you're on mute, Scott. Can you hear us now, guys? Yes. Okay. Sorry, the, the speakerphone went off in the middle of that presentation, so we had to recall in. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for presenting. So did the committee have any comments, general or specific? Let me just go around and I'll start with Ms. Thoughtwell. Ms. Thoughtwell. Sure. No, I just want to <clears throat> really say congratulations to you and the educators, just those scores to see where they started to where they landed. That is impressive in a hybrid learning environment for most of the year. Um, so I just congratulate you on that. It's just outstanding. Okay. Brianna. Um, I echo Diana's. Um, thought process as well. And I just want to say thank you for, you know, collaborating and working together um, so that it's unified as it comes across. It was very easy to follow along um, what your goals were, how you achieved them, what your future goals are, and things of that nature. So thank you. Mr. Pavel Vasileo. Skipping to me. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was a a clear presentation. I, I appreciated the information on it, and um, I I would like to say just uh, if this was uh, something I noticed with the excuse me with the little school data when when you've got eighty what was it like eighty six percent sixteen percent and one percent right for the breakdown that's not just missing the middle that's exceeding the goal right that means that even though you want a fifteen percent at tier two having so little in tier one. I, just for people that are kind of casually watching, like it, 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 that wasn't a near miss. That was exceeding with with room to spare. And I think it speaks to the phenomenal improvement and effort put in by you guys, the administrators, and all the teachers who, you know, as your data shows, really made up for some of the lost time at the end of last school year by leaps and bounds and got kids caught up and, and on a great path forward. So thank you. Mr. McGowan. Uh, I would certainly echo all those comments, and I'll just give a uh, Mrs. Gabriello, you are representing uh, all members of school councils uh, here tonight. So uh, thank you and, and, and every, every parent who was on a school council. It's, it's uh, been one of my, uh, uh, it's always been it's something, it's somehow it's how I started getting involved in school. So it's always been of an interest to me, but um, so thank you and, and, all, and all parents who participate. Um, I think the data uh, is, is great. Partly because you know it's it's the kind of thing that um, a, a, a coach like Bill Belichick loves. There's there's good news, but there's and this kind of data always gives you stuff to work with. Um, it, it, and so uh, and I don't mean to minimize the good news. The, you know the, the the achievements are are really excellent, but there's always it, it's great that there's always gives you and and some of the data that we don't even see the the deeper dives that will show you right where you need to. To work and focusing on geometry, for instance, at the Hood School. I, I, I mean, I think that's that's great use of that data, and uh, um, I'm really excited to see how it continues to play out. And for my comments, I'll start with Mr. McGowan rubbing salt in the wound. Mrs. Molly never wanted me on the school council, so just kidding. Understandable. <clears throat> Understandable. Yeah. That speaks to her character. <laughs> that, is not, that is not true. <laughs> um. <clears throat> So a few comments. I mean, I echo everybody else's thoughts. I mean, great job overall. Um, and I'll give some more specific feedback on a couple of things. Um, I mean, number one, I think the goal of these school improvement plans is to look at what we've done, but also where we're going. 
And so it's nice to hear what's happening. But again, the main point of today is making sure that we're setting ourselves up for next year. I think it's good that we all are looking at the same things. The two, the two comments that I would, I would mention about ways to maybe differentiate things a little bit is it's great that we all are look, looking at the same goals, but the data is not exactly the same at every school. You know, the data, the numbers aren't the same at every school. So I don't know if every school needs to have exactly the same numbers. You know, I mean, if the batch is already at 90%, a goal of 85% is probably not where we're, we're stretching to. You know, and if other people are struggling to get 85%, I think it's, I think it's okay to understand we have different school students at different schools. We draw from different communities sometimes, even within North Reading. And so just making sure that, you know, there's not an obligation that everybody has to have the exact same numbers because we don't have all the same students. And I love numbers. I push metrics. I love metrics, but I also think especially at elementary, metrics are not the only thing also. And so sometimes if some of the goals are beyond that, I mean, I, I like Mrs. Molly pointing out this, the survey of the students and trying to make sure that the students are, are, are feeling good. And, and, and I think after COVID, that, is, that should be a highlight for next year is making sure that our students adjust back in. And Dr. McKay talked about recess. And so I think that's an important part as well. And so some of the goals can also focus on that. I definitely think there needs to be metrics in these goals, but I also think there can be more than just metrics as well. And so, but overall, I thought they're excellent. I think the schools have been gr done great this year and seems like good goals for next year. Okay, so I do think that every school should, you know, we should vote on every school individually. And so why don't we go into order? I'd like to have a motion to accept the little school improvement plan for 21-22. I move to accept the little school improvement plan for school year 2021-2022. Second by Diana. Okay, any comments or discussion on it? Okay, Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. Rich. Aye. I'm an I as well. Thank you. I move that we accept uh, the school improvement plan for the Batch Elder School for the school year 2021-2022. Second. Any comment or discussion on the batch? Okay. We'll vote. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. I'm an aye as well. I move that we accept the school improvement plan for the fifth school for the school year 2021 2022. Second. Any discussion on this? Okay. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. Janine? Go home, dog, bye. Rich? <laughs> aye. I'm an aye as well. Pass this 5 0 again. Thank you all. The elementary principals. Now I will point out there we ha we have a scheduling at at eight thirty. We're supposed to join the select board meeting. I think what we're going to do is just sort of adjourn at that point in time quickly, go there, and then we'll come back if we haven't finished things on here. I think we can do that, um, Dr. Daly. I, I think we're going to try. <laughs> um, we're going to try to get done before. <laughs> I'm just going to suggest. I wonder. I think the principals out of solidarity always stay on for each other. Mm. It's a very unusual circumstance where we're going to have to leave and come back. Correct. Wondering, do we take the, uh, the the elementary enrollment at the little school out of order so if the elementary principals want we can to do leave? That. Yeah. I mean, that's just a thought because we might be going after the high school. Yeah. But we'll try. Unless you guys go 15 to 15. But this could be quick. I'm fine. I, I'm fine to do that as well. We can we can do that. And then if people don't want to stay, they don't have to as well. And the other thing I would just say is it's also fair to, you know, we, we have received the improvement plan, so we have looked at them. If we Go a little bit quick on some of them as well, um, but yes, yeah, so if we want to jump to the the little school enrollment, this is really for Dr. Daly to so kind of I'll update us. Share that, um, you know, this is really something that I, I should have brought to your attention <coughs> earlier. Um, we tried to make a decision that we felt was in the interest of what's in the budget. So essentially, what what happened was at the end of the school year, there was some uh, there was drop in enrollment in already a very low class. Um, <coughs> Ms. Molly can correct me, I believe at the, at the moment it's between 23 and 24 students total. I believe there were four students that we believe are not going to be in that class. So at the time of, of the decision, it was 23 students, would have been a class of 12 and a class of 11. We felt that you know there's a school committee policy speaking to minimum recommended class size as well as maximum 15 is what's recommended for minimum. When I met with Michael Connolly and Ms. Molly, uh, what we said was, since the budget was already approved to include two full-time teachers at that grade level, 
Um, we didn't think it was in the best academic interest of the students to have a class that small, 12 and 11. So what we suggested was maybe there's a way to do this with one class in 23 or 24, but have that other FTE be a full-time interventionist who is working with that class, providing small groups so they can continue to do a lot of things you would see in a, in a class of that size. Um, but then that person also could assist in other places in the building. And to keep for this year, at the very least, since it was already in the budget, to keep those two FTEs. This will impact, if there's not other move-ins, this may impact the same cohort moving to grade four and grade five. Um, but it's something that we moved ahead with based on, on that decision. And I, I do think that it was probably something I should have brought forward. I'm going to say this is a learning curve for me. I think it would have been good to talk about enrollment here because the enrollments you were presented were for two classes at third grade. And so it was a bit of a surprise, I think, when um, some of you who are parents in the building received that information that way. So I, I, I do apologize for that. But I wanted to share it as a discussion point. If you feel that we should go a different direction, we can certainly still reverse that. But we have moved ahead, posted at the interventionist position, and had someone apply and, and approve for it. Um, so at this time, that's the status. But I, I'm happy to take this whatever direction you recommend. So I, I will jump in first on this one, um, and I will also say that if we vote on this, I will abstain from the vote because this is my daughter's cohort, actually. So I don't want to actually vote on something that's specific, specific, yeah, specific to her. I think that I think maybe in the summer we need to be clear because we've had school committee goals in the past, and I couldn't find them. Kind of unwritten rules about like where the class sizes should be, like K through one or two should be at you know 22 or below, and Three, four, five can go a little bit higher. You know that that class of little school was like I think it started with like 30 students, so there was two of 15 or 28 or something like that. And going down, I completely agree with the decision. I think if you're down to 23, 24, two classes of 12 doesn't make sense. But I also do think it's important that the school committee does hear when we're going to potentially change cohort sizes because in many tough budget years, the school committee has argued very hard with the select board and, and the town to try to get more funding for positions. And I think we need to know what the class size is. And so I was a little bit surprised that I heard from the principal that this was happening rather than hearing from the superintendent. And again, just saying like, I think, and it was, and just the timing of it was right after the budget had already been passed. And so even for the select board, I want to make sure that, you know, when we argue for more funding from the select board that we don't, then make a cut right after the budget passes because it looks like we're trying to do something fishy potentially that we freed up money from this position that we could use for something else later on and so i do think it's really important that when we have these class sizes come up that you know we're included in it and so and, and i also understand that when people move sometimes it is just an inconvenient timing it just doesn't work out but um yeah i i support the change to the budget i support the change I like not letting somebody go last minute. I like, you know, having the interventionist and seeing how it goes for the year. But, you know, I do think that it's important that we, you know, while we can't direct the superintendent on where to use FTEs and all this, we do argue for the budget and we present these numbers to the select board. And I think it's important that we all, you know, understand where we're at with that. So that's just my thought. I will just yeah. say the timing. We, we, you know, we found out about it after the budget after our last week meeting, there was a bit of an urgency because we had end of the year step up days, we had to make class assignments. Uh, but I, I do wish we could be getting different and I will make sure to do that. Does it feel like we should uh, discuss this and it's just, it's just, just be open about it within the financial planning team? Well, I think the monitor, because they're going to have the intervention, as my understanding is it won't really change the monitor for next year. Yeah, I understand, but much. Just, yeah. Saying what the circumstances were. Yeah, we could we could we could mention it as well. So it was never your intention to um, reduce by a teacher. It was always the intent to keep that teacher on. For this year, we decided to keep what was in the budget. So okay. so again, I thought we were having two classes up until May, late May. Um, there were there were some move outs, uh, a placement change. It also was impacted. There were a few teachers who had their own children enrolled in the district this year. Um, and I think that was sort of a, you're forgetting that, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, we're not in COVID anymore. Those numbers now are, and people are going back to their home schools. And I think all of a sudden, 
Um, you know, we were spending a lot of time looking at the kindergarten numbers, and all of a sudden it was looking at the third grade number. So, yeah, so our intention was we, we felt because it was budgeted for, we could use this position within the school, still meet the needs of those third graders without having a, you know, going from a class of 14 to 24 is a yeah. big is a big jump. Yeah. So we felt having the interventions they were doing, we thought this was a good way to approach it for this year, but we, we didn't speak to Ms. Holly about, you know, moving forward, I, I don't know necessarily that we're going to have that FD in the budget, especially if there's a concern. I think that was made clear. Yeah. Because yeah. it's here, huh? So I think Chris, we need to discuss that for the future, right? So not that we're advocating for that at this point, but that may be part of the conversation next year. And and just to kind of, I mean, Janine found it because like, I, I never know where things were, but like, even in the, um, what was this? The little presentation tonight, it talked at the bottom about, you know, the enrollment and what the school committee has tried to do in the past. And we've always tried to keep grades one to two at or less than 20. And then, you know, three to five, trying to do 22 or below. So again, occasionally, for reasons where like, it's going to be two of 12, it doesn't make sense to keep it at, at that. But, you know, I do think that that's, personally, I think that class size at the elementary is one of the most important factors in education. And I think we've advocated for that for many years. And so I want to make sure we continue to do that. So do you want to vote to approve the change or is that what you're, I, I don't know that we need it, but I don't know. I mean, if we're not, if we're not eliminating the position, position, we probably don't need to vote to approve. Yeah. Um, Something else I was going to mention quickly, but if I don't think of it in five seconds, then we can move on. Three, two, totally lost. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, Dr. O'Connell, I think we are up to the middle school. Okay. Just, I just need to do my presentation. One second. Are you able to see that? Yes. Okay. So before we get started, I, I do wanna say thank you. I know that everyone has thanked the school committee and um, the central leadership. Obviously, I, I, I'm very appreciative of the district's support in talking with colleagues in other districts. Um, just everyone in the nearby communities are so impressed with North Reading and how we handled everything this, um, this past year. But I do want to focus my thanks on the teachers at the middle school, but obviously in the entire district. I think that the teachers did an absolutely phenomenal job. And I can't speak for the other schools, but at the middle school, and I, I will show pictures as proof in a few moments, uh, my teachers were moving every single block on a cart to different classrooms. And they did that to keep the children safe. So the children stayed in one place and the teachers moved. And every time they moved, they needed to plug in and unplug and get started. And literally, um, while they were moving, they were engaging with their students at home through their laptops on their carts. Maybe not safe driving, um, but they were rolling down the hallways, going to their classrooms, engaged in the with the learners at home. And I, I just, I can't say enough how impressed I am with their perseverance their dedication, and, and I hope that every single one of them is going to take the much needed time over the summer to take some self-care, to recharge and reset because they, they truly did an amazing job. I'd also like to thank my school council, uh, Laura Oliveto, be, before becoming the interim assistant principal, served as a teacher representative and then continued to serve as a staff representative while being the interim assistant principal. Dean Walsh, who we honored earlier tonight, has been a longstanding teacher representative on my school council. Marissa Morello was a community representative. She's also a, a North Reading High School parent. Amy Luckowitz, who I, I know that many in the audience know, is was our community representative and has been for several years. Linda Emery, I think I, I saw her name on the little school, school council. Linda Emery served as a parent representative, as did Joni, Jody Cloney. And without them, I would not be able to present to you tonight our um, hoped for approved new school council plan. But before we do that, I do just want to hit on some highlights, as the elementary school principals did as well. Um, my brief topic, talking points, I'm watching the clock here for the, the 8.30 pause. But 
providing high quality synchronous learning for students for the duration of the year. Daily school-wide Google Meetings. We started every day this year with a Google Meeting. So that was a, a community meeting for the, te the teachers and students in the building and students at home. Strong iReady growth in math and reading. And I chose to show the data a little bit differently tonight. So it, it might look different and I'll, and I'll speak to that as I emphasized a, a different point. Implementing a guidance referral form with the mood meter was a highlight and also implementing a data analytics tool. And I'm just gonna to speak to those briefly and then go into my proposed new goals for next year. So just again, the synchronous teaching and learning, there are a couple of snapshots of the cart. So everybody had a cart like this and in true teacher fashion, they bedazzled and decorated their carts. You can see Ms. Cinerate, a video production teacher, and Ms. Demore, a health teacher here. You can, oh, I thought I had more pictures. Um, I don't, but teachers really rose to the occasion and zipped around the hallways. Every 49 minutes, you could see uh, carts all throughout the hallways getting on to their next class. And then when they, as I said, when they went into their next class, they had to as quickly as possible plug in and get ready so that, so that they could be prepared to um, obviously to provide high quality teaching to the students in front of them and the students at home and they made it work. And as I talk about the iReady scores, I just want to show what I chose to present was the growth not the not the tiers; those are I mean, are available, but not, not the tiers that the elementary schools showed. I chose to show the growth because we didn't have the MCAS scores, as we know. And the MCAS scores, we usually focus on the student growth percentile. So I tried to to duplicate to the best of my ability what the student growth percentile might look like based on the iReady scores. And so our goals this past year for reading and math were that 80% of the students at each grade level would meet their typical growth target number. So when students took the beginning of the year iReady, iReady then told us what their typical growth target number would be, as well as what their stretch growth target would be. So I set our goals on 80% of the students reaching the typical growth. And you can see in math that 64% of our students met their typical growth target number. So not obviously not the 80%, but 37% of our students met their iReady stretch target number. And that's to me where, um, where the money is because in order to close any achievement gap, you really need to grow more than a typical amount in one year. You need to hit the stretch growth. And again, those numbers are calculated by iReady once the student completes the initial diagnostic in the fall. So, and I did put a little explanation of the stretch growth is the growth recommended to put below grade level students on a path to proficiency which is again, the best way to close the achievement gaps. And in um, the reading iReady scores, you can see that 48% of the students met their typical growth target number and 23% of the students met their stretch growth target number. And so obviously the more students that meet their stretch growth target number, the better for closing the achievement gap. I also wanted to just, again, talk about the guidance referral form. I did, I did speak about the form that we were using, actually Justin Madison did at the March school committee meeting that focused on the middle school. But over 270, it's students, but it actually, that, that's actually should say entries. There were over 270 entries, and I'll fix that because obviously a few students re filled out the form more than once, but 270 entries where students sought out an appointment with their guidance counselor. And within that data that I obviously, I can't share too much because it's students, you know, students um, personal information, but this is just a quick snapshot of and over the course of a few days, students, this was the prompt in the guidance form is they fill out, you know, some information as to why they'd like to meet with their guidance counselor. But this was for a few days in January where they, they're asked to look at the mood meter again, which was on the previous slide. 
sort of look at the mood meter, which is designed by the same um, organization that Glenn is working with. It's through Yale, through the Ruler Program. So in looking at the mood meter, the students were asked to identify the emotion that best defined where they were in that moment, which is, is great for building emotional intelligence and emotional awareness. But so they did then enter that into the form and you can see things like, I don't, I don't know how many of the school committee, well, I probably do know of the school committee members too have middle school aged children. Um, others have had middle school aged children. And often when you ask them how they're feeling, it's a very, you know, either an eye roll or a sign. But these are words like glum, chill, stressed, uneasy, drained, alienated, anxious, um, annoyed, repulsed. So not that those are positive uh, feelings, but helping middle school children learn how to describe what they're feeling and to be specific in their feeling and why they need to see their guidance counselor is really an amazing, I think it's, it's amazing growth for our children. And it's, a, it's, it's wonderful to be able to provide them with the ability to learn how to express how they're feeling. I think that building emotional intelligence in our adolescence is really essential. And so I'm, I'm really proud of that work. And then also for a couple of years now, the middle school has been working with an outside consultant. His name is Paul Minuti, and we've been creating a data analytics tool. And I just wanted to just show a quick screenshot. This is of grade seven. So I can at, you know, with with ease, I can filter this button. Again, I'm not gonna, it, it's a screenshot because it would have student data, but I can go to the student level. I can filter by gender. I can filter by different benchmarks. I can filter by IEP status, low income status, and I can see in the same way that iReady has the color codes, I can see when students are exceeding um, meeting, partially meeting or not meeting. And I worked with the, the consultant to define what those benchmarks are. So this one's the mood meter. So for this quick screenshot, six students had placed themselves in the green and 17 students had placed themselves in the red. And if I were to click, if this was a live, um, if this was the live tool, I could click on that and see who those students were. This is also the quartile ranking. That's one of the um, filters that um, the Department of Education has been using for the last few years that shows the, the lowest 25% of our students. And so I can, filter by the lowest 25% of our students in terms of MCAS performance. I also wanted to be able to look at, and I can look at all of these benchmarks for just one student or again at the grade level or for a group of students. I wanted to look at their grades and how their grades compare to their iReady scores. So the iReady is over here, and the grades for ELA and math are here. And we kept just updating this with more and more and more information. We, the previous year, pre-COVID, we also had attendance as a benchmark as and behavior. So really just getting a, the whole picture of how students are progressing helped us really to identify students for our weekly intervention block, whether they needed extra reading, math, executive functioning, or um, you know, emotional support. We were able to really use this tool effectively. And so our goals for next year, are, I'm keeping the same iReady goals because I, we did not meet the, the growth target number across the three grade levels. So, so again, it's not the tiers. I wanna be clear that it's not saying that 80% of students will be in tier one. It's saying that 80% of students will meet their growth target number in ELA. And then 80% of students will in science, which doesn't have iReady, but I wanted to include science. Obviously, it's uh, I had included it in years past as an MCAS tested subject. I, we are using common assessment data. And I did at the end of the school improvement plan that I submitted to Patrick, at the very end, I think in Roman numeral five, I shared very specific updates as to how, how we how we achieved our goals for this year. And same for same for math, 80% will reach their growth target number. And then I kept a technology goal. I think it's important that although technology may not become its own big rock any, for, any longer in the district improvement plan, I do think it's important 
to continue to acknowledge the importance of technology in teaching and learning. And shout out to Dan Downs and his team for helping the entire district, but specifically helping the middle school to, to provide opportunities for teachers to teach synchronously by giving them the tools that they needed through technology. And so we will continue to work with Dan and the technology department to make sure that we stay up to date on the on the innovative and and um, um, you know student centered digital learning tools that become available. Student support services. Again, you may notice that I've my headlines of my goals are based on the district strategic plan. So, student support services. We will continue with our weekly MTSS intervention blocks, and we will. Our goal is that 80% of the students that are identified for an MTSS intervention block will demonstrate improved performance in the targeted area of their intervention after a 10 week session. So we typically run our sessions for 10 weeks. We take pre and post data, whether it's math, reading, executive functioning, or an, you know, a, a, a different targeted intervention. We will say that 80% of the students will meet their growth targets so that after 10 weeks, perhaps they no longer require the intervention. That would be the hope. We will, by June 2022, we will improve the effectiveness of our social emotional supports as targeted at school avoidant students as measured by improved attendance data. So we will closely monitor attendance data throughout the course of the school year. I would like to, to just make note that we are with the support of the school committee and the district, we are able to have a 0.5 adjustment counselor added to our team in the fall. And the way that we've chosen to utilize that new position is to implement a bridge program, exactly like the one that has been very successful at the high school for the past several years. And so we will be starting our own bridge program at the middle school that will be staffed by the 0.5 adjustment counsel, counselor and also by a special education teacher who will serve as an academic interventionist and help those students uh, returning from um, being out for, of school, help those students get acclimated and back on track academically. And the adjustment counselor will provide the therapeutic component. We think that the bridge program will help with attendance. You know, Unfortunately, I, none of us have a crystal ball, but I do anticipate the possibility of increased school avoidance uh, in issues at the secondary level due to COVID. And I wanna be as prepared as possible to provide supports for students who may um, be requiring interventions to successfully transition back to school after the pandemic. And then the last area is equity. We continue to do pre and post school climate surveys. We've been doing that for years now where we, we survey students and staff at the beginning of the year and the end of the year. And I have to say that this year, although successful in many ways, I think that the climate data shows that it was a challenging year for students as well as staff. And I think that we have a lot of rich data from the June post survey to focus on in terms of you know, targeted improvements for the fall. And then we hope to continue the work that we started a little bit this year with equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion by helping to build our the awareness and understanding of those themes for staff, specifically as they relate to adolescent development. So again, I, middle school is a unique place. Adolescence is a challenging age, and these topics are are always challenging, but teaching through the lens of understanding adolescent development, I think is essential when we begin to really um, unpack this work. And I, we're gonna start with the staff and by the end of the year, we'll make sure that 80% of our staff will demonstrate an increase in their awareness of these themes, particularly relating to adolescent development. And I think that's my last slide. So I'm gonna come back here. Not bad, I tried to go as quickly as I could to save time for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. O'Connell. And actually, I think just for the public that I know is very worried about it, I think we just push back the select board because they're behind in schedule right now anyway. So. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, comments, questions? Um, I'm gonna go. I found, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jenny. Um, 
I found that the data that you had um, with the mood meter and how you could track all of the different things um, from attendance to how they were doing in class or how they were feeling that day, that is incredible. To have that at your disposal and be able to help a student or a, a, a grade of students or a class, you know, I, that's, that is really awesome. I'm glad that you found that. I don't know how you did, but I think more schools would probably uh, fare well to have that kind of information. It really does give a full picture to a child. When we were meeting at the team level and we discussed the student, to be able to access all of that information very quickly really gives a full picture as to how the student is, is um, progressing or not progressing. Good job, thank you. Anybody have other comments? Um, I, I really like the, um, the data on uh, meeting growth target, um, and and I think it would be great in concert with that that tier data as well, um, because the, the the growth target data means that you're constantly thinking about all the students, including the ones that start and end in you know tier in the top tier. So uh, I think it's a great approach and a great you know a great addition to the to the data you get, that you're looking at. It's an excellent point for the students that do start in tier one and end in tier one. They still need to grow and they still, we still need to monitor how they're growing. Um, Dr. Connell, I just had a, a random question about eye ready, and I don't know if you or Mr. Colleen or someone can answer it, but does the length of time, meaning the duration of the testing period from elementary school to middle school, does it increase? Like, are the students in middle school tested for a longer duration of time for ELA and math test for I writing? They're not a timed test, Diana. They, they are an adaptive test. So when the students begin, each question that they answer, they it's artificial intelligence really zones in on how they're answering and gives them questions based on their previous answers. And then they end when they've kind of stopped after they consecutively cannot answer questions. I don't know how many say they can't answer four questions in a row, then I already stops and they calculate their grade level and the, where they are in the domains. Okay, so it can be longer for one student and shorter for another basically. Absolutely. Okay. All right, thank you. No, I was just curious because you know, it was the first time in middle school where I got a comment about from my son with testing because he usually doesn't, it doesn't save him, he actually enjoys it, but he's like, the eye ready is so, like, almost like he was burnt out and I was thinking about adolescence and, you know, if you could look at the front end of the testing versus the back end to see if that performance was better, but um, because it seemed like just his age, he was just like a little bit burnt out with um, how long it was. Um, so I was just curious if that was some type of trend with middle school versus elementary school. Yeah, it, it can take several days, you know, 50 minute blocks roughly. So it can take an hour anyway. And um, it is challenging to keep up the, because they're doing it in, in math and in reading. So the, the test exhaustion is real, especially at the secondary level. Yeah, I just feel like they're more likely to throw their hands up, you know, at that level. So thank you. Chris, any thoughts? No, I'm good. Good presentation. Thank so. you. And I'll just say, I think, I think Dr. O'Connell, I think we, I learn from you every time you speak. And so I think that's, you know, really good. I mean, I think that we, we have great leaders in this district, but, and, and that's what they are. They're, they're principals or administrators, but you're a leader of your school. It's very clear. And, you know, I appreciate all that you give back. And I just think overall for the improvement plan, this is exactly what I'd be looking for. I think there's a good mix of metrics with, other stuff in there as well. And so I really think this is um, a, a fantastic improvement plan. So I support it. Um, Thank you. Uh, welcome. I have a motion to accept the middle school improvement plan. I will move that we committee vote to accept the uh, school improvement plan for the middle school for the 2021-2022 year. Aye. Uh, second. Okay. Vote, Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Janine. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an I as well. Passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, so since we're not going to the select board, I think we're going to have Mr. Lopret here. I'm going to move. And everybody needs a little bit of a break to get up. Yeah. Right. Let's take it on that. I may take an extra minute or two so you can begin. I'll be right back. <laughs> Should be exciting. Is this the first presentation on the screen since it might be? Yeah, February. I hope it measures up. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention today. I, I, you know, I'm happy to be here in person. It's a great opportunity. Uh, equally as uh, the people that presented, the fellow principals that presented before me, I want to thank. I want to thank you all. Uh, obviously, I want to thank our teachers. I want to thank our very committed members of our school council. Uh, you know, a group that really kind of went above and beyond, found ways to stay engaged. We're always very committed, and I really am, am uh, appreciative of their time and their commitment. Uh, I am hoping that the focus of, of this presentation is not necessarily driven by how COVID uh, impacted our experience, but how our core values guided our experience. Uh, these three you know, pillars have really uh, been the, the bedrock of what we do, and I think the students have totally embraced uh, what they stand for. And my hope is that you'll see parts of each of these you know, as we progress through our presentation. Some highlights from 2021, uh, and these are kind of thematic, and you'll say, I, I didn't want to get into the and if this is all only, uh, this slide is only about this, or that other slide is only, you know, uh, dedicated to teacher specific. But, you know, obviously, kind of at the start of the year, this kind of uh, rapid, accelerated implementation of the one to one model and get everybody up and get, getting everybody um, connected so that our hybrid uh, model would work and be as effective as it was. And I think certainly people have said it before me how uh, the feedback from other parents, other communities, our own community so impressed uh, and just so appreciative of where we've been, what we've been able to do. Um, obviously, that idea of connecting those freshmen and, and getting them feeling like they're part of the school, even though they're only there half the time, uh, was a huge piece. The counseling team working, working very, you know, uh, beyond, uh, above and beyond the, the commitment to student need in being uh, aware of mental health uh, and uh, responding to student need and things like that. Uh, the Parents Association trying to keep us kind of as consistent as we could with our normal routine. We did have our freshman presentation, uh, which is something that they've always done. And we've always had a good experience with that, Gary. Uh, shifting a little bit now to kind of uh, topics that might be, you know, kind of maybe specific uh, external data or uh, award opportunities with, with respect to the field by literacy. Uh, 14 students were awarded the field. We were still able to do that at an increased rate than last year. Two earned the seal with distinction. You'll see some data on that in a bit. Uh, we still had AP courses. Uh, we followed that same methodology that we did last year when we kind of during the, the shutdown, so to speak. The, eight, the uh, college board had uh, a modified test uh, but we had 86% um, of the students still opted in to take the test. And you'll see that, that the data from this year uh, is essentially right on the same number, 86%. Um, a bit about the creativity, the performing arts classes, find, finding a way to make it work, finding a way to be outside, finding a safe way to do the variety of things to make those classes function. I could be more appreciative of that commitment. And then creating an opportunity you know, throughout all this to get uh, students SAT tests when so many sites were closing and not allowing them to do that. Uh, and, you know, immensely appreciative of the guidance uh, department in helping coordinate that. And I know there are a lot of very, very thankful families that they got a test in uh, both in uh, October and then in April. Uh, other highlights from 21, uh, 2021, Commitment to our UDL uh, goals for our teachers. We had uh, world language teachers and special ed uh, department teacher representing the world languages 
committee on the, uh, the new, that new curriculum framework. Uh, we had fantastic buy-in uh, from the social department, the social studies department about the city action project. Uh, led by Mr. Rosa, the coordinator of counseling services, the uh, counseling team put together a, a guide on self-injury and suicidal ideation response. Uh, and that's a huge step in, the, in that direction as well. Uh, and then we had, you know, not just uh, students at the at the core, but staff, well, and um, you know, staff mental health as a major focus, and the counseling staff attended to that as well. Uh, some other highlights, student specific. Say, uh, we've had a, a very strong mean ask uh, presentation. Of, of, I'm sorry. The, Northeast Massachusetts Association of, of Students Councils. Uh, we just had a outgoing president and now we've got a uh, incoming secretary for this coming year uh, for, for the Northeast um, sector there. Obviously, I, I am very indebted to them being awarded that uh, administrator of the year. Uh, that was a tremendous honor. MASC is still able to do what they were able to do, notorious uh, participating in virtual performances. Uh, we have three new clubs that you may recall we approved, and um, one of those clubs, the uh, Social Activism Club, was recognized as the as the winner for its PSA around uh, recognizing Black Students Lives Matter. So there was a lot going on amongst all of this, you know, disruption and how are we coping and how are we doing, and still managing to win Cal championships in fall, winter, and spring. So. You know, I think, again, how do we do against COVID? Well, again, it was more about how do we adhere to our, our core values that have always guided us, and that's how we've been able to, what we've been able to do. The, um, and I'll get to this after a little bit of data here. Um, as I mentioned before, the seal of by literacy, you can see the steady increase over the last three years and how successful that program has been with students that have earned the seal, and then again, the seal with distinction. Uh, I had mentioned some AP data points, um, and you can look at the kind of the 2019 and the 2020, and obviously now in 2020, that was that modified testing format, but you see a 10% you know, um, increase in scores of three or higher, um, kind of a score comparison of how we did it uh, across specific tests, and then notable increases or decreases uh, I'm going to let you kind of take that information in. The, the calculus A and B are on the same line. But obviously, um, specifically with the physics, um, an unbelievable growth uh, right there. So I'm very excited about that for the future. And even though we went down a bit in environmental science, you still had 18 out of 22 earning a qualifying score. And again, down a bit in the site, but you still had an over, again, overall qualifying scores as the average in nine and 10. So if you've seen the, which I believe you have, if you've seen the, uh, the copy of the School Improvement Plan, and again, this, is this, this presentation is kind of a, a nutshell of kind of where we, what we've done in 2021 and where we're going in, in 21-22. Um, so you'll notice that we've transitioned, and I work closely with Dr. Daly, in kind of transitioning our school improvement plan from a two-year plan, which is what it had been for a long time, um, to a more, I think, manageable, maybe timely, um, responsive one-year plan, um, in an attempt to kind of make that as clear as possible, um, the, the current, you know, um, proposed improvement plan has information that was relevant to the older document because it was, again, a two-year document, and thus the goals were uh, kind of two-year goals. And the, we're going to look at those briefly now. Um, maintaining a high level of personalization, maintaining our commitment to uh, growth and development, maintaining our uh, academic program, staying true to NRPS 2025. And again, they're, you know, uh, they serve us well. They're, they're kind of broad goals, 
but I think we can all agree that they've, they've certainly, um, the school has been uh, in a good place and the students have been responding uh, incredibly well. I think the faculty does a, a tremendous job. Uh, but these nine goals, uh, and again, as you are familiar with them, uh, maybe have been a little bit too uh, burnt up. So we want to get a little closer. Uh, and with that, oh, I didn't expect that to happen. We are kind of looking more at the idea of aligning specifically to the, the three big rocks that uh, are presented in NRPS 2025. So we can take a minute here and look at goals for 21 22. And again, this is with the idea of students coming back into the building full time, what their expectation is, what their concerns might be, what teachers' response uh, needs, and their attention needs to be focused. So, a, a, a really uh, an adherence to, to look specifically at uh, students in the multi tier system of support, what's happening at that tier one level, what's happening at how many students are at a tier two level, how many students are at a tier three level of support and how are we measuring that growth for uh, those numbers. Uh, so that is kind of goal number one, to make sure that we're attentive to, those, to that data as we start to see it come through and, and monitor it. Number two, um, create and implement an instructional model that effectively supports identified students and skills development in English and math. So students that have gone through uh, this hybrid model and now we're coming back, school full time, different uh, different set of you know kind of going back to the old expectations. And what happened if I had some gaps as a hybrid learner? What happens if I had some deficiencies? What happens if I passed the, the, the previous course with a minimum competency, but I might have some scaffolding uh, issues in in the knowledge base? So I've got very creative with the schedule where we're. Uh, looking at a way to offer, you know, really focused uh, instructional support during power block with the with the block schedule in the you know the kind of the four four by four schedule. There's not a lot of flexibility to take a student out of the class and decide you know you're going to be doing something else when you, you know, we've got you lined up for a credit. So uh, we've got some opportunities to work with the power block time and to really to really leverage that time. Um, I've spoken with teachers in the math department, I've spoken with the math curriculum chair, the same with the, the English, um, and I think we're going to be able to really uh, capture those students that may need some specific time. I think sometimes we might forget the fact that, you know, small group is great, but it's a time piece. It's, it's, you just need more reps at something. Um, so that's really the core of goal number two. Uh, goal number three just learned all of, the, all of this uh, information about hybrid learning. Now then, how do we really leverage that with a blended learning model? And the, the student is not turning in the device. You're keeping the device. Um, and we just had this, this whole experience with you with the device at home and how, it's, how, how we're able to leverage uh, that new experience in class. So how do we take the best of that and keep moving forward with that? Looking back at uh, a goal that we had put in place, you might recall we talked a, a couple of years ago about this idea of a senior uh, final exam exemption. And there's a lot, the, the, the value of that and the, the presentation of that and the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the positives of that uh, initiative have not diminished in any way. But in fact, I think moving forward, it even makes it kind of more a focus area to say, Let's do this, let's see what it looks like, let's gather some data from it, and then look at it from an equity perspective. Who, you know, how, how well do we feel like uh, the, this initiative is serving us, and then who is it serving? And why might it be serving a specific group over another group? Um, so I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to learn from that, and I really want to stay committed to that. Um, and then lastly, to stay uh, focused on this idea of our AP model, um, and knowing that uh, there are tremendous pressures on students that they may put on themselves, or that they may feel that they have to live up to certain things, um, or that external forces may put on them. Um, 
But how, how does our AP model and how we, we build around that AP model, um, how is that serving? So these, you know, the hope is that the um, school improvement plan that is in front of you, that has is, is a bit of a crosswalk from the old model, the old two-year model, to the one-year model, the older goals that are presented there, but also with the new goals. And I'm going to show you this uh, Graphic Organizer is essentially going to be the key for the department uh, leaders, the curriculum leaders, to be presenting their department goals through this model to say, here's what I'd like to do, here's what we want to do in the department, here's how it's related to a school council goal, here's how it goes specifically to what we're trying to do in the department, here's the relevant data, resources that, I, that we may have in the department that we may not get, um, and then what I really expect to see in the short term and then in the long term. So to really kind of tighten up um, what happens, uh, you know, capture this time of everybody's back in. Uh, we have they've learned a lot, they've gone through a lot, want to pay attention to student uh, wellness. Um, and I think with, we want to have a, a really uh, keen eye on equity and in a way to do this, to approach it this way, I think, really allows us to do that. So that is my presentation. I know it was a lot. I know you're on the clock. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. LaFrance. So I want to start, and I'll say for the last couple of years, the school committee has given some comments about making some changes. So I appreciate that the goals are a little bit more specific. But we've also mentioned there should be some metrics. All four of the other school plans include some metrics in there. The goal of an improvement plan, in my view, is to clearly identify what's not working based on some measurable data, to have specific goals and not like an overarching goal with some very specific things that are going to happen to meet those goals, and then some way to measure that. And I'll be very honest, I just don't see this in the plan as it is right now. And that's my main concern. I think that your focus is on better issues. I mean, goal number four, I would separate into two because equity was at the end of it, which I don't think relates at all to the first part of that one. but. I think there are some good goals there, but I don't, I don't know how we look back in a year and say whether that was met or not. I mean, every other plan we've been able to look at and say, okay, we, we, we got close to it, we didn't quite, quite get there, but we're not there yet, you know, but, but here's how we're going to make adjustments. And I'll be honest, I think this is a start, but I personally don't think this is an improvement plan that can be utilized by teachers to really identify what they're supposed to be doing next year. So personally, I again, I'm just one person, but I personally think that metrics in some way to measure the success of this needs to be included more specifically into this plan. And, you know, in more vague ways, we've, we've talked about this in, in previous years about the metrics and some of it being more more directed. So, I mean, my personal thought is this is a start, but there, there needs to be a little bit more done before I would feel comfortable approving this as, as the improvement plan for the school this year. But that's, again, that's just my thought. Uh, I, I don't know if others have other thoughts, but that's, that's my very honest thought about this. And I don't think the school could be, should be setting what the goals are. But I think we are supposed to be making sure that the plan that is presented to us has a clear vision and has some way of identifying if it's being met or not. And I just feel like you have some good goals there, but there's just not there about how we measure that at the end. And I feel like there's a little bit more work that needs to be done from my my own. I don't know if anybody else has, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> am I waiting or am I responding? What am I doing? I don't know. Yeah. I, well, I would say, I, I guess in response, and I'm certainly, you know, I'm not, I'm trying not to end the conversation, but I, I'm certainly, in response, I would say 
that the high school doesn't run iReady data every year. It doesn't look at saying, well, let's just let's go back to this metric and measure off of this. Right? We we have our frameworks, we have our common assessment strategies, we have an across department specific uh, you know, assessments and things like that within the framework. My hope is that these these areas of focus are there for for my use, for my the the leadership steps that I want to take, but then also that the department level, that the department leaders are working within frameworks like this to say, okay, where am I going? What what, what do I know? I, I I know I need to focus on. I think the department wants to focus on. And this goes back to Dr. Gilly's point of this kind of the more alignment, the better. Um, again, I, you know, I, I want to know. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly happy to see that our students, you know, when 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 given the choice, you know, you don't have to take that AP test. They take, and they're doing better. And that's and that's a strong that's a strong indicator of I think why those courses are successful, why the teachers do a good job there. Um, so I think that there is data out there that I can certainly, you know, we, we can look at data from specific common assessments from, you know, the questions that look at how well, you know, freshman to sophomore year in English, you know, are, are tracking for vocabulary or things like that. And we, I can bring more of that in. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to suggestions. I, I certainly uh, appreciate the feedback. Well, I, I, I think it doesn't have to necessarily be eye ready because there's there's AP scores, there's other, other other scores. When I just look at specific goals, like goal two, create and implement an instructional model that effectively supports identifying students and skills development in English and math. How do we know if that has been met? I just don't I, I don't see like here are the five things we're gonna do for this, or how are we gonna measure this at the end? And that's my my concern is somewhat numbers, but also very specific, like how I'm going to meet, how we're going to meet this goal. And if Mr. McGowan? Uh, yeah. Um, so, and you can correct me if I'm not yep. saying the same thing you are, but in a different way. Yeah. Um, what I'm not, what, what, what I don't see in the plan is, you talk, you talk a lot about student achievement, and, and that's great, about, about AP programs, Really, those are certainly important things. Where, where, what I'm not seeing is where we're not succeeding with students the day, in the information that you're providing, um, and and how we can lift those you know lift those students up to where we are. Support. We're not fully succeeding with students. Like that. Um, and we can you know, be lifting them up more, uh, and I I think that's the kind of thing that separates. And I. Appreciate the fact that high school is a different animal than elementary school, and you know, it's so much more focused at the department level. But that's the kind of that's the kind of change that I think we need to see: is lifting up of students, you know, who, who were at, at the beginning of the year maybe a little bit behind, and at the end of the year they're where? Where are they? And how and how have they progressed over? No, I appreciate it. Thank you. So I would say I would say what I Typically, there's MCAS data here. Uh, two years ago, I, you know, I was able to show, hey, look, look at, we'll look at how the growth that we made in, in mathematics. We can go back and look at that at that slideshow. We talked about of the points that we earned in certain areas, and we grew from 83% to 87%, and, and, and specifically in that um, high needs category. And that has all that has been a goal for three years. We didn't have MCAS. I felt it was disingenuous to put it on here because there's no data to measure to, to, to go back to that and say, well, I mean, is it still a goal? Absolutely, it's still a goal. Are we gonna did the, did the kids take an MCAS test? Yes, they did. Let's see where it is. Let's 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 see what it looks like. It's you know, I, I don't know how good the data is going to be. I don't. I mean, again, they, they gave that test in a completely different form and and model and means and and right. Are we going to say it's exactly the same thing if the numbers come out better? Or worse, I don't know. So to me, it it wasn't a steady ground to present a uh, you know a, a real initiative around in, in two years. Sure, let's see where it is again. Um, but I'm trying to be responsive. I think to what we're going to see in September, students coming back, 
And again, as Ms. O'Connell talked about, we have the 6 to 12 uh, clinical uh, you know, coordinator for the 612 bridge model. Um, let's see what, what those numbers look like. Let's see what the uh, you know, students at the tier two support level is. And, th and again, that's, that's, what that, uh, that's what goal two is about, is, is saying, look, we know there's going to be kids that, that are, are going to be behind. We know there's going to be a gap. What are we doing about it? Well, we're, we're, we're pulling out that lowest 25 percent. We're finding a way to, to feed them in for, uh, in thirds, essentially, into a, uh, a model that is repetition and drill and exposure and uh, using, using some online strategies and online techniques that will help, help rebuild and provide that scaffolding that, that, uh, that, we, that we worry about because of the experience they've been through. So I, I did not go into depth about those type of things, and I, I can certainly give you more of that in a, you know, um, in a follow up, whatever it takes. Uh, but I don't, I don't want you to think that what, what, you know, what isn't here is not here. Understood. Well, just, 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 just to that point, AJ, um, I think. I think that this plan shows that the ideas are all in the right place. That there, that there is a plan. Got the idea. Um, the way that I look at, at this, because I think absolutely how I agree with Mr. McGowan and Mr. Buckley on this, is um, something that I used to get feedback when I was teaching, which is um, some of these seem more like steps of an action plan as opposed to goal itself. And I think that the difference then isn't that you need to rewrite everything in your Right, just it's presenting in a slightly different way. So, like for example, people who want to be crazy implement instructional model that effectively supports and identifies students, skills development, and teaching mathematics as a, a very important step towards improving the school. Um, but it's not to be a dead horse, but how, you know, how do how do we know, or how do you know that that's been done effectively? And I'm sure you got away, but but because we don't know that. Becomes harder for us to say, like, oh, we see it, we can understand. So I think it's, it's not that the plan isn't a great plan; it's that it's um, without some inroads for us to kind of see. It's hard for us to uh, appreciate the strides that will be made, or or see where improvements can be made. Janine, I saw you your hand up too. Yeah. Um, so I think, as I mentioned with the other four. They seem to align um, the way that they presented it, and um, they did put in that they knew that there was X amount of students that were, you know, needed improvement on goals and succeeding. So you have that information, but it's not in here, so we can't see it. So if at the beginning of the year you have 75% um, needing improvement. And by the end of the year, that 75 has dropped down to 25. That shows that you had a goal and you achieved it. So um, don't I ready test them, but you must give some kind of confidence to test in the beginning so the teacher knows where to focus. So that information would be the basis of where we would get the metric from. Um, and it took me a little bit to like go through it, and I actually went to it several times. Um, the layout is difficult to understand. Um, this part makes a little bit more sense, but it's still not diving. In fact, we don't need to know the nitty gritty, but your goal uh, is related to the, the counselor, uh, the school counselor goal, and you give a little bit of information, but it's put in such a way it's harder to read. So if you could give us the metrics and guess maybe almost kind of fall along the same lines as the way that the, the elementary and middle school kind of their rubrics of how they lay it out it kind of makes a little bit more sense and it's I mean, easier I, to follow. I, I didn't, I, I mean, I completely understand what you're saying. I, we're we're going to look at a couple of different things. I'm going to we're going to either say we're going to rely on our 
common assessment testing, which, which if that's what we want to do, that's, that's great. And say, okay, here's all the sophomores across these that took the same course across these six questions, and we'll pull that data down and see how we. My 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 goal is that the department level leaders do that. They're doing that. I know they're doing that. We've talked about that. I can we can we can we can you know make those department reports again more specific. I'm trying to. Uh, not necessarily tell them this is what you're doing. You, you're in your department. You have a sense. We, we've had those conversations. We can look at if, if I took you know, grade nine biology data. Can I can I really compare that to? I think you know obviously the NCAS does that. It's like let's go cohort against cohort. That was that you know the class of 2019 freshman versus the class of 2020 freshman. How did they do? Well, again, there's a little bit of like, huh, these kids have always excelled, so, right? So you're always kind of, and that's why they do the point system. Right? That's why that accountability system is as complex as it is, because they, they're measuring all those things. So, again, we can look at NCAN. I can look at common assessment. We can look at AP. We can look at, uh, so we, let's say, let's go back to just grade 10 testing for NCAN. If, if, I, if I come up here and I say, well, you know what, here's where we're in grade 10. Here's where they were in grade 8. I say, wow, well, that's growth. Well, that, that should be growth. It's two years. Right. right? We're not going to have a grade 12. So, I, I, again, and that's why I want to go back to the, to the curriculum leaders and say, kind of, you, you tell me where we're going. You tell me what, what you want us to look at. So, uh, I, I appreciate the feedback, and I, I'm, I'm going to. I mean, definitely listening to it, and I and I, I think together with Dr. Daly, with, with Mr. Kalina, like we'll you know we'll look at what what data do we need to really want to pull out here. Um, if if it's the data piece that we that we you know or or the, the more full plan component. Again, um, I, I'm trying to give you a snapshot uh, in this you know in this presentation. Um, and I would say, you know, have we talked to the department leaders? Do we have a sense of what the what a software system might be that the kids can use, and how they're going to go into the class, and how we're going to figure that out? And, you know, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, again, we didn't do it yet. It hasn't been done yet. We we didn't right. We didn't think we needed it. Now we need it. Uh, so I I have a you know what it should look like. What will look uh, look like in six months, in twelve months? Yeah, we'll be reporting on that. And again, that's kind of the other the shift piece that. That we're working with uh, Dr. Delian, right? There's like the goals presented to the leaders now over the summer. They're starting on the way in 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 the fall. Here was here's where here's the school improvement plan goals, not the old system where the uh, the committee worked with the goals and hammered them out from October to November, and then they kind of got published in in December or reworked or retweaked in December. So it's a little, you know, it's, that's, there's, a, there's a, you know, a shift there as well. And, and Mr. McBride, I think, I just think from, from our point of view, if we want to know that we're approving the plan that starts in September when the first student arrives, and that it's not that plan is going to be worked on in October, September, and December. And I understand that things are going to be modified, but I just, I just feel like there's not enough here right now. And so, I mean, I, I don't know what everybody else thinks on the committee. We can vote this if we want to. I personally think it should be revised a little bit more and maybe presented again in August or September and you know, see if there's a little bit more specificity to it. And again, I mean, I, I'll just be very honest. I, I think there needs to be more for me to feel comfortable approving it right now. And I don't know what other people think, but I, I think it would be better if there's a little bit more, like I said, I think there's been some steps in the right direction from where it was before. But I think there's more to go, and I personally think it should be revised a bit more, and then we look at it again afterward. You know, maybe work with Dr. Daly, Mr. Clean, um, you know, your staff, and and that's what I feel. Um, but we can we can vote on it, or we can you know kind of come back in a in a, in a couple months on it in more specificity. I don't know what other we do here, but I that's my Dr. Daly. Yeah, sure. 
So I, I just want to say, um, you know, as you know, one of my goals this year is to work with all the principals on aligning, and I, I want to thank all of them, AJ especially. I, I think the high school's plan is very similar. The two-year plan has been in place since before you were principal, right? And so sure. that model has been in place for many, many years, and I would say out of all the plans that I have asked to change, AJ has had to change the most, and so he's in a system, he's kind of midway through a process of a two-year plan that we're asking to go to a one-year plan. Um, and so I have also said to all the principals continuously this year that, you know, we're doing this a little bit backwards. Because we didn't have a full retreat last year, we didn't have our, our, our NRPS plan. So I've said to them, start making changes. Don't fully align. Don't fully change it over. So he's, he's kind of in the middle of two different pieces. The, the goal template, I think when you see that, fully developed where the departments are going back to these goals that are kind of overarching and then going in and saying, okay, what does goal number two mean to my department? And what, is the, what does that data look like? And I, and I would agree though, it's not in there right now because those templates that are filled out in the plan reflect 2021 and they don't, they don't reflect these new goals that they have to see. They're aligned with last year's goals. So I think we're kind of seeing it in the middle, but I, I do want to take a, you know, I do want to shed some of the conversation on what we did see that we liked and the improvements. So I agree those those few goals there. I think you know we've worked very closely on this. It's been a focus of ours. It'll be continue to be a focus next year. Uh, but I want to highlight some of those real positive accomplishments and changes from from where we were. And again, there's not that there's something wrong with the way it was, but it's just it's very different. You know, I I think part of what we talked about it is it's alluded to in these goals, but I think what we need to do to flesh it out a little bit more is when you talk about those AP metrics, what specifically are we looking at? And we've talked about is it is it the you know number of students with disabilities who are able to access AP courses? Is it you know so identifying those those areas for improvement and really trying to focus on that as a goal, a measurable goal. The same with our lowest 25 percent, right? We have that MCAT data, we know who those students are, let's look at those students and see how they're doing across their classes. And I think that's what, um, you know, it, it is very different with high school. It's a much bigger school with multiple departments and trying to get all of those folks on the same, um, you know, into the same process to change it at the high school takes more time. So I do think that, you know, the recommendation here, I think, I think it's a plan that we have already is to bring our department heads early in the fall together to talk about the 20, you know, the next school year, getting those goals in there early so that then we have that alignment with here's the department of goals for the year and now the educators can start to align their goals. So I think that's happening already. So we can certainly give an update in the fall and then this will continue to evolve as we get into the spring. I hope that that um, sounds like it's on course for where we want it to be for next year. Yeah. And I will say that the, the format that you obviously implemented at some point during the year that's just a consistent format. So yeah, I think if you can, first of all, get all this part, I, I assume the, you, it was just a timing thing, right? That the, when the department member reports are early in the year and they did the old way, and some did it the new way. Um, but I do like the format better. I think it will make it clearer. Um, I just would go back to the, you know, and I know it's more complex because of the departmental nature of this, but if they can add data, if they can add that sort of before and after data or before and after goals uh, to their to their reports. I think that's the kind of thing that would be. Uh, I, I think I think celebrating even AP. I mean, just it seems to be deeper than that. But, I mean, you know, but, uh, you all. Know that, but. Yeah. And again, I, I just think from our goal, when we're in six months, we're going to have a mid-year report on how things are going. I think it's going to be really hard with what we have right here. And so I would I would prefer, my vote would be to revise it a little bit more, put a little more depth into this, and then let's come back early in the fall and look at this again, Diana. So when you think about, I, you know, I, I'm not 100% aligned with all of these, but I, I completely see your point. I think we cannot look away from the fact that high school is dramatically different. There's not, when you think of, when he's focusing on AP and he's focusing on MCAS, which is not existent right now, 
um, that's the standardized testing that they have that they can depend on. So now you're talking about, think about all the courses in high school. Think about the abundance of teachers and aligning them to a data and analytics project, which is pretty much what you're asking them to do. You can't turn that around in a couple of months. That's like a large scale effort. So to me, yeah, to say we have feedback that we want to get more analytical and more metrics oriented, I think that's good feedback, but to say, I don't approve your plan as is, this is where you are in a point in time, I don't think it's the right decision. So I just want to share that. And the only thing I would say on that one is even if they're not metrics, even if it's just like if you look at some of the other plans that here are the specific things we're going to do for this goal. I just feel like they're not there. I, I, I don't I don't exactly know why some of the goals are there because it doesn't specifically say this is what's not great right now and this is what we're trying to do and then this is how we're going to do it and this is how we're going to measure it. And I feel like we have some of that there and some of the ideas are there, but I'm assuming some of it. Like, you know, the, like the high school final exam. What is that part of? Is it part of, you know, trying to focus on not overwhelming students? Is it trying to look at mental health? Is it trying to look at, you know, changing learning where like now it's more of a UDL where like, you know, we don't think final exams work, but like, is that part of something? Like, I just, I just want to know a little bit more about that. I think it's the hierarchy. Yeah. So this is a school level improvement plan that we are looking at. There's multiple layers, I'm assuming that others are looking at that are much more granular that we're not seeing that would inform in that way. But when you're looking across that many courses and that many teachers and then having to roll all of that up in a meaningful way, that's, that's challenging. So, I mean, I just think that without us doing like a deep dive to say, you know, I do think it would be helpful to at some point have data to say, you know, kids really struggle in these areas when they come into 10th grade, these, these subjects, and this is what we're doing to improve that. I hope we get there at some point, handpicking certain areas, not seeing everything, because I don't think we should see everything at this level. But, um, you know, for where we are in this point in time, focusing on the standardized tests and not having a real meaningful comparison right now, it's appropriate. I'm an outlier, I realize. That. Can I, we, we, approved, we approved the senior exemption you know, a couple of years ago, those kids presented. They said, this is why we want to do this. So these, these are the initiatives behind that. Um, I, those are still valid. I still believe in them. I still think they exist. I still think that's the, re that's the reason why we're doing it. That's the reason why it was approved. I think, I think most of the same people were here. So it's yeah, but like goal to, to move forward. I'm just wondering what, why it's still on the goal. And like we haven't done it. We haven't given okay. final it, it, it exams for the last two years because of, because of COVID. Yeah. We've never experienced it. So it was a good idea then. I think it's still a good idea. I want to do it. I want to try it. We, we agree it was a good idea, but we just haven't done it yet because we haven't given exams. So that's why it's up there. I, uh, I, uh, I agree with Diana. I'm not sure of this. So, if I, I would like to get up, maybe a more frequent than a mid year report update on the bottom. But, um, back down to Diane. Um, but I, I, based on what everyone said, I, I agree that I'm not sure what not approving this. I don't think there's a rewrite that needs to be done between now and if it's more work that has to be especially given the, the timing of, of some of these changes that and stuff you can see and in, in transition document transition I'm not sure some of that stuff can be really fixed what the process will work out so I I think what we will have in the early fall are the templates completed by each department aligned to these new goals. And I feel like that is something that would be valuable for everyone to see. Yeah. Um, it's not a completely rewritten plan, but it would be that update that would say, you know, here are the new goals, here's the new way we're doing things. They then present those goals throughout the year at the meetings, and then next spring they're writing it for 21-22, and they would be a part of this presentation. So we're like a year behind a little bit, but we're gonna we're gonna do an intervention in at the fall to get those 
department goals, which is which is different than the way it's been done for many, many years. And that's work that AJ has already committed to and we've discussed this work. We have a, a leadership retreat this summer, and that's a place where we're going to get this started. So I, I do think we will have a nice update in early fall from our curriculum leaders who are going to be filling out these templates. So it wouldn't be you know, a completely rewritten plan, but you at least have those documents for eight departments that would be good to share. So, so as I see it, we can, we can take a vote on this. We can put a motion on to approve. We can vote on this. And I think we all agree there's been some improvements here. We all agree that there's some more level of specificity that we're looking for. The question is whether or not we feel like this is enough right now to say yes to, or whether we want, I mean, I think either way, there's, there's a request for some further update later on. But I think we can entertain a motion to approve it, get a second if there's a second, and then we can vote and see if we feel comfortable right now, or if we can <coughs> to that. Yeah. Point, I, I'd say that as a public reading with what the director said, that there are areas where uh, where specificity could be added. I think that this this functions as a school plan. It gives school guidance on where uh, the department wants to go and has clear steps to it. Um, I think there might be ways that it can be written that would make it more accessible down the road or provide for the benefits, but that said, it's a valid tool to be planned, I think, where it is right now. Sure. Uh, on that note, I move that we uh, accept the high school school plan for school year 2021. Second. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Oh, Chris. Let's figure it out. Let's put it into the chart. 
but spec it out, work with that teacher that's going to do it, and, and create that. Okay. And I guess, I mean, my last thing of discussion is just it. I just think from the school committee's role, our role is to make sure that we believe in the plan, that we can measure it to make sure that the schools are making the progress that they need to be making. And I'm just concerned that there's not enough in here right now for me to be able to do that later on. So that's, that's my concern. But we have a motion on the table. We have a second. We vote on it. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. Janine? It's more the best to be yet. Chris? Aye. I'm a no. So, half the four to one. Thank you, Mr. LaPrat. Thank you. Can I, can I make a comment? <clears throat> we did not give Mr. LaPrat the same, and, and the high school staff in general, the same appreciation that we had questions about the plan, that we gave everybody else and well deserved the work that, that, that you and your team have done this year has been amazing. Especially the work we did at the end, put, pulled together a, a, a most, almost real, almost normal senior week for the for the seniors. It was phenomenal and very much appreciated. I didn't want to let that go by because we had questions about the plan. So thank you. I'd like to echo after the fact that we had five school committee, I'm sorry, five school improvement plans tonight at all is kind of an achievement for everybody this year. And, and, no one has worked harder than AJ to get all these things in there and make sure that they, they happen this year. So I wanted to thank him especially for that work. And we'll continue to work on this. This is a big change, and uh, we're going to keep working on it together. This is part of our agenda. Thank you all. Okay. I think we need to recess right now quickly to join the select board because they're done with their water hearing. So for everybody on this Google link, we'll be back in probably about 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, let me we'll just talk it down at this point. I think everyone else can certainly Yeah, I mean, nobody has to stay on here, but for any members of the public that are still here, we will be back on this link in probably 10 to 15 minutes. Can I, can I suggest a bio break? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Actually, we probably should, we probably should, should vote to uh, recess. But. Do we have to? I, don't, I, I think it's we're still here. Yeah, close enough. I think, I think it does suggest that we should vote to recess okay. to join. I, I move that we take a recess while we join the school select board. Okay. I second. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Rich, Chris, thank, thank you so much. Rich, AJ. Hi. Hi, Diana. Hi. Janine. Well, we vote on take a break. Recess. Take a recess. <laughs> thank you, guys. Pass the five zero. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. So do we have to have a motion to go? Yes, I move that we uh, uh, reconvene after recess. I don't know if that's what we've done. Second. Second. Uh, Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an I as well. We are back, everyone. Aye. Dr. Downs, can you hear us OK? I can. Can you hear me OK? You sound oh, the great. Best, the best of the night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Must be, the, must be these headphones. Um, all right, I'm going to put my presentation up. Excellent. Great. I'll go to cybersecurity here. So, I was expecting you to be able to put up on, a, on our big screen. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone see this okay? Yeah. Yes. All right. So I'm going to kind of do a quickie here. Um, my goal tonight here is just to give a, an overview of, um, we've had quite the review based on um, issues, of course, going on in K-12 education of issues related to cybersecurity. Um, you know, I feel like we've really dodged many bullets through the entire kind of COVID epidemic and um, just general shifts in um, issues happening in districts across the, the state of Massachusetts particularly. Um, I just wanna give a um, current state of cybersecurity concerns. This is, you know, kind of a mix of not only what um, I kind of have you know, put together also working with our network administer, administrator, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Langford and Dr. Daly. Um, you know, some of the key major types of attacks schools are seeing are DDoS attacks, ransomware, phishing, and security data breaches. Those are the 
primary attacks. Um, these are happening because um, schools sometimes are on the end of the technology update spectrum where sometimes they're running some older applications, sometimes they are um, in need of upgrades ahead of maybe you know, larger businesses. Um, so sometimes they do get targeted, particularly um, districts that host their own websites are particularly targeted on some of these attacks, particularly the DDoS attacks, um, districts that host their own websites, which we don't, um, or have moved to um, an external host are often targeted because the sites get older, they become a little bit more of a security risk. Also, software that um, causes some of these attacks is more readily available to a wider audience of people, um, whether it's from the dark web or um, other resources. Um, and also, you know, there's little protection for some of these on site hosted resources since they're, you know, mainly supported by, you know, districts themselves. Um, you know, in terms of ransomware, you know, the, the increase of malicious files being, you know, shared through email or downloaded onto the network have has become a huge concern. And many of these concerns go above and beyond what some of the the local school supports can kind of prevent. Um, and the mitigation for these can not only be expensive, but also sometimes out of the expertise of the technology team within many of these districts. And you'll see them having to reach out for additional support to, you know, either after an attack or, you know, for, you know, to help prevent new attacks. Um, and of course, some of this was brought on by the impact of COVID, um, the increased reliance of technology, the increase in class invasions through, you know, Zoom and, you know, other meeting platforms was increased. Um, and, you know, teachers took devices home and a lot of that was brought on, like some of these devices didn't receive updates while they were away from the district network. So, you know, you know these aren't particularly, you know, to North Reading particularly, but we, you know, we've kept all of these things in mind as this is kind of the, the big picture of some of this stuff is happening across, you know, K-12 schools. Um, you know, particularly with DDoS attacks, these are when um, basically, DDoS is when basically a big push is made at, it's called the denial of service attack. And that's when the district's bandwidth of resources with large amount of data is suppressed. So um, basically attacks come in and they basically shut down the internet bandwidth of a district with a tons amount of data down its internet pipe. Um, and it prevents districts from connecting. And um, honestly, there's, you know, there's no silver bullet often to prevention of these attacks. And most of the services um, do take an intensive amount of time for response to mitigate these services. And they also require extensive costs and support programs over time. Um, and solutions, you know, when you go out for solutions to many of these, as we've researched, there's no guarantee for immediate uptime. Um, and some of these sort, you know, some of these can come from in-house threats or external attack from ransomware. Um, basically, data packets are sent to flood the the internet, um, and it reduces internet connectivity and it shuts districts down for sometimes up to a number of days. Um, so we, you know, we reviewed some of the options for this. Um, many are quite expensive and you know could impact budgets pretty heavily. Um, and uptime is limited. So it's it's you look at the expense of some of these services, but there's no guarantee that it's going to get you out of the issue any faster than if you you know just found a different option. Um, you know, schools are often to push down their existing network and initiate a mitigation or a re reorganization of their local services to isolate the issue. Um, and often, even if they have a backup network, if they haven't kind of solved what caused the original issue, that secondary backup network can be targeted as well. So that's one of the larger types of attacks. Uh, ransomware, of course, is a user organization organization whose critical data is encrypted so they cannot access files, databases, or applications. Um, and of course, a ransom is then demanded to provide access. Um, what we're finding is, you know, this is something that happens, you know, a lot of times through emails, malicious links. Um, basically, people somehow hand over the access to the, the network through um, these fraudulent attempts at collecting data within within a network environment. Um, 
And what they're doing is, is once they get that access, they also try to leverage for not only the ransomware, but also can continue to leverage. And once people are kind of caught in that cycle, um, they'll threaten to share personal data and then also potentially use the data they've collected to perform identity theft, credit fraud, um, all through this targeted phishing. Um, there are no public reports in the past two, 2020 of districts having paid any of the extortion fees due to ransom um, where during the past 2020 year. Um, and it's also demands made to schools may have significantly increased, um, exceeding $1 million per incident. Phishing security and data breaches. You know, we just talked briefly about phishing. It's a cyber crime targeting through email, telephone, and text message, but posing a legitimate institution. Um, security and data breaches is another large issue facing K-12. Um, that's the unauthorized disclosure of student data, but may also include significant amounts of data about school staff, including educators. And um, we're also continually reviewing district data processes to ensure effective data privacy and policies, um, review of shared data and district resources and staff knowledge of the importance of data security. I'll have to, you know, kudos to Dr. Daly support with this cybersecurity grant that we've been working on in the district. Um, the staff knowledge around what phishing attacks look like, what good security practices look like has been tremendously uh, beneficial. Uh, whenever we're doing these cybersecurity tests across the district and putting, you know, you know, phony emails out there, um, I'm getting lots of emails of people asking, you know, is this legitimate? Does this didn't look right? It's done a great job at alerting people on how to notice and recognize these potential issues, which is the first key line to defense to help securing the network. Um, and that cybersecurity grant has been a major um, help and at just making the awareness of the need to be more aware about malicious links and the possibility of sharing inappropriate information online and personal data. So we've, we have a number of preemptive um, pieces of work that we've put into place, um, especially over the past year, but also um, prior that we've kind of built a, a workflow around um, to try to continue to keep ourselves safe in this kind of, you know, uncertain time of cybersecurity issues. Um, you know, we continually monitor uh, software and application services for access as needed, you know, whether that's Google Meets and keeping them secure, our district email, and also our storage options of how cloud storage options are connecting to our students and staff. Um, and we're continuing to move software and websites and digital resources, which um, have been in the past stored locally to a cloud service, stored off the main service, so they have to be targeted as closely to the district. Um, you know, cloud security is a separate issue, um, you know, something that's provided by generally by these cloud providers of the, the storage of those applications. Um, but when you're targeted as a district, that's a separate entity. Um, our internet connectivity, we have increased the internet bandwidth to a one gig line. And, you know, a, an additional possible benefit of that is the larger one gig pipeline during a DDoS attack is easier because if we recognize something coming in um, on a larger pipeline, the possibility of shutting it down a little faster is possible. It's not a guarantee, but it is, you know, larger than some of these small, some districts do use a smaller internet pipeline, which gets um, jammed faster. Um, we we deactivate all the unused ports to limit DDoS attacks and scan for open ones. Um, you know, internet ports, you know, within a building can often be if um, maliciously kind of attacked if something is plugged into them. Um, so our network administrator does a great job at continuing to manage and monitor those ports for any activity other than what's supposed to be on our network. Um, you know, there's always, you know, the potential for in-house threats, whether it's um, students on networks, um, slam from the web with an attack or an external attack with ransomware threats. Um, we also utilize a firewall and that firewall runs a snort um, on to see the traffic and how it comes down and how it moves throughout the network. Uh, we continue to use device-based antivirus software. We support regular updates of current operating systems and security patches. And with our district servers, we we consistently update these servers and we utilize loop attack software on the switch that helps recognize when a loop attack, that's basically when something comes on the network intentionally to loop back um, and create a problem. And we also use a simple network management protocol and that's the management of um, our servers to the devices they're connected to and having an organized way of you know 
keeping them in order. Um, and when we we move data in the district, we're very we're very careful that we use secure FTP, which is a secure file transfer. Um, and what that does is it limits the amount of information shared between um, ourselves and you know other vendors that we need to share information with. And those data privacy policies are in place for staff and students with vendors that we that we choose to use. Um, you know, and in closing, the reviews that these this kind of work has kind of brought us to is that uh, we've started looking at, you know, in, in terms of DDoS attacks, um, the case studies of other districts, what are potential solutions when these types of activities happen, um, reviewed the potential of additional backup networks and how they could potentially support us in a DDoS attack. Um, we reviewed all budgetary impact of additional monthly costs to support mitigation services if they were needed or if we want to add them in a preemptive way prior to a, an attack. Um, in terms of ransomware, we are currently reviewing, you know, the additional costs that it would take to have a 24-hour monitoring of our network if something were to happen any time of day with a malicious file infiltrating our network to, you know, disrupt it. Um, and we have existing filters in place that have add-ons that make this possibility um, part of one cohesive package, but it's something we need to review the additional pricing of. Um, of course, we have increased educator awareness of our cybersecurity threats through the grant. And um, I've been working on a data privacy work group to kind of make myself more aware of privacies across the country that people are kind of putting in place into K-12 education. And we continue to educate our educators on, you know, unapproved and approved resources and what the differences are and in, in working with them to understand, you know, good privacy practices. Um, we continue to be a member, our membership of the Student Data Privacy Council to support the review of data privacy practices and resource approvals. And we look, you know, moving forward that we really need to figure some sort of plan of budgeting to provide additional funds to support some of these cybersecurity needs, um, whether that's a DDoS mitigation service, uh, an additional backup network, um, specialty software to identify files, ransomware more quickly on the network if they were to infiltrate. Um, and we're also continuing to move hosted software to cloud solutions as our budgets allow. Um, a majority of our hosted software now is sitting on the cloud. Um, and we continue continued education on and tips on cybersecurity and steps individuals can take to keep our network safe and also continually to review our data review processes as data you know big conversation around data like how these processes shift and change and how do we stay ahead of keeping our students and staff data as safe as possible um, as we use it i've added some of the resources i've tried to be respectful of everyone's time as well um, and I can put the link to this presentation into the chat, just if people want to review it on their own. Um, thank you for your time and thank, open, thank, you, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Downs. I think I probably understood about 25% of that. So that's good. <laughs> um, questions, comments? Um, so I'll ask the question that our, uh, our, uh, CTO gets asked at work all the time, what keeps you up at night the most? Uh, just how quickly this stuff changes. Um, you, I would say the, I think the DDoS and the ransomware are both unique. Ransomware is becoming more sophisticated. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's infiltrating its ways in multiple, multiple new types of ways. Um, the DDoS attacks are um, unique in their own right in that they um, they can sometimes, you know, come from the dark web. You know, there's there's no and also the fact that there's no silver bullet. You know, I think that's that's the most challenging part of this is any one of these solutions is not a solve all, and there's no there's no solve all um sometimes when these happen there just needs to be the pay you know when these incidences happen it, it's really just having you know some sort of idea first of all where you're going to get the help from from the state to support you getting back online and then also the patience of people who are going to be ready to be prepared for a day or two where without limited or no connectivity and um what those steps look like and how we can best support people during that time 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Donald, like a couple quick things. Um, first and foremost, thank you for your leadership throughout this year. I know that you know we talk a lot about going online and hybrid and all of this, and you know that was obviously your doing mostly, and so a, a lot of good planning. But you know you're you're the tip of that, and so thank you so much for all the work you've done. It's just it's kind of amazing to me that over more than a year we never had any big issues that we know of, at least. Um, where you know there are large outages or any sorts of issues that we've heard about in other places. So thank you for that, first and foremost. No, th uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, one, I mean, you talked a little bit about what we can do to hopefully monitor, to deal with it if it happens. Are there insurances as well that we can look at or are they just not affordable to a district? In terms of a, um, insurance for the ransomware, we're not advised to pay ransom. Um, Dr. Daly and I have discussed that. We've, we kind of reached out to the state for some um, further information to confirm that is we are not to, you know, as a state um, education um, organization, not to pay ransom. Um, in terms of like any other type of insurance, um, I do think it's worth the investment to upscale our ransomware um mitigate like the the software that can kind of fill out these 24 hours a day i think that's the next level of sophistication is that um, these things could happen any time of day you know they might not happen when we're all in the building it might not happen it might not happen on a teacher's pc it might happen on a student's chromebook at some point um you know anything that we can do to enhance the number of eyes on issues that might happen to our network that are in the best interest of protecting the network, I think is a, a valid, um, you know, direction. In terms of the DDoS, um, you know, we've reviewed some of the potential solutions to that. It's, you know, it's either committing to a new fiber line with additional mitigation added to that fiber line or coming up with an additional choice of solution that may require a network that could that we would be able to utilize in terms of a backup. Um, but at the same time, there's been districts that, you know, had that place in plan, that, that plan in place, and they, both networks were hit because of um, once one went up and another one went up, they went right after the next one. So, um, you know, I think we just have to think carefully about, you know, how, you know, the cost for this is extremely expensive. Um, and we just have to see how that can be properly budgeted for and also compare that to the risks. And when he says there's no silver bullet, that's what the cost is like five, ten times what we're paying for the service. And then all it does is get your priority to fix it within 24 to 48 hours. It's not, it doesn't prevent it from happening. It's just like an antivirus or something like that. So it's still, you're still going to be down. It's just you get priority and you're paying not that much money for it. We just didn't. This time, but we're, we're looking. We're yeah. constantly looking at solutions. Okay. And and why why did you send me an email asking me for my social security number? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that wasn't me. No. <laughs> uh, okay. Any other comments, questions? I think it's a dad joke out there. Come on. Okay. We appreciate it, Dr. Downs. Hope you have a great summer. I know you'll be working anyway. No. But. <laughs> And all the all the all the work with the tech was an amazing collaborative effort, and uh, we look forward to another year of um, working with everyone to get the devices in place and and getting everyone back back to what we can be a good sense of normal. Well, we appreciate it, and we, we I think on the school committee side we are going to continue to support what you guys are doing with and, and having the uh, devices. And so, thank you all for thank you for all your work this year. Thank. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's move through this. We'll go back to continued business. Do you have any updates on the end of the year? Dr. Daly? Um, just, just to clarify, there's a lot of emails going around about whether masks are required or not required. I'm, I'm going with what I'm reading from the commissioner who updated today that uh, masks are not required. They are recommended for those that are unvaccinated. Uh, the Department of Health still has not fully updated their website, but the commissioner clarified that it is an advisory and not a mandate for those. So we would continue to have um, 
it recommended for students and staff that are unvaccinated that is an option, which is consistent with what I put out the other day. Thank you. Um, pool testing will continue. We are ordering Binax testing at home, and we're going to explore pool testing for the summer. Um, and the other piece of it, the only preview for the fall, it sounds like there's going to be no mask mandates, no distancing requirements for the fall subject to updates based on numbers, but that's what we're seeing pretty consistent now, which is, I think, pretty welcome news for everyone this time. Excellent. Okay. On to the new business, NRPS 2025. Sure. I, I have a presentation. I feel like, should I just do a summary? Or yeah, I think you can just, I mean, I think you sent it to everybody and it doesn't look like there's any reason the public here right now, so I think we can just... Yeah. I've shared it out. We're going to have an update tomorrow. Uh, if we stay a little longer, I'll go right into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have tomorrow morning, I'll just be sharing about the you know, really provisioning process for NRPS 2021, the idea, 2025. The idea here is to get the voices of more stakeholders in the community um, to think where do we want to be in 2025, what does it look like, and then what do we need to do to get there. So the purpose of tomorrow is to update them on the process, what we're doing, and then there's an exercise where we'll do it at least one as a group um, to walk them through what you do. And it's a Google form actually. So I've done the whole thing as a Google form. I'm doing this to the administrators too. Um, and then on their own, people can continue to complete that Google form. The administrative team will then review all that data at our retreat to make you know more informed decisions. And it, you know, I'll say this many times tomorrow, just because someone puts it on there doesn't mean it's in the plan. It's just another piece of information for us to consider. But if we start seeing things five, six, seven times, then we really should be thinking that it should be in there. So we hope to have as many of the viewpoints represented in our plan as possible. Thank you. Look forward to that. Good to hear you again tomorrow night. <laughs> um, okay, routine matters, minutes. So we have a uh, Janine, are you kind of lead us through this May, May 17th open session? I make a motion to accept. May 17th open session meeting as written. Okay. Any discussion? I guess we have to do so it's sort of virtual officially. Um, Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. I'm an I as well. Yes, this is 5-0. Make a motion to accept the June 5th open session town meeting minutes as written. Second. Okay. So, Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris, are you going to abstain because you weren't there? Yes, you were. Rich? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Passes 4-0. Thank you. I make a motion to accept the June 10th executive session minutes as written. Second. Uh, Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. I make a motion to accept the June 10th open session meeting minutes as written. Second. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Pass the side zero. Thank you. Mr. Connolly, any budget update? So I know there was a budget update in the last um, packet as well. I just did a statement when I was present at the last meeting um, to see if there were any questions. There's not a lot of new information. I think we're working on closing out the fiscal year, which is a lot of working all the way for really 10, 10 days to two weeks, but everything is um, progressing well, and I, I think we're going to have a few closeout, and we're certainly going to do a lot of the year-end type items that we had forecast and planned for, certainly special education that came in. Um, we can that and see that reflected on the board, um, and I think it's, 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 it's certainly the things that always come up. And, um, I think we're able to address those areas and still really a, you know, a, a small amount. So, um, you know, I think we're also monitoring the status of the revolving accounts and trying to make sure that the carryover forward balances will be at the, the level we needed to meet the, the, the budgeted you know, forecast or offsets for next year. I don't see anywhere that that would be issue or concern and concern um, just trying to maximize all the available funds possible to the budget. That being said, I'll turn it over to any specific questions. Okay. 
have none. No questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. Any staffing update? It's in donation. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses for the 2020 2021 school year from the Batchelder School Parent Organization, totaling $7,751.50. Second. Discussion. Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. I'm an I as well. Passes by zero. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses for the 2020-2021 school year from the J. Turner Hood Elementary School Parents Association, totaling $18,255.02. Second. Any discussion? Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Aye zero. I move that the school committee com uh, votes to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses for the 2020-2021 school year from the E. Ethel Little Elementary School Parents Association, totaling $10,591.65. Second. Any discussion? Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Aye zero. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses for the 2020-2021 school year from the Middle School Parents Association, totaling $17,668. Second. Any discussion? Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. <laughs> Sorry, the math doesn't add up. It could be that it's just very late at night. Does it not add up? No. Uh-oh. No. We, 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 we appreciate okay. it anyway. It's like nine cents. Yeah. So should it be yeah. seven? That's okay though. What's the total? Sorry, yeah, I was distracted. <laughs> That's okay. Well, let's. I mean, let's get it right so we don't have to do it later on. I got a calculator here. Hang on. Three seven one seven point oh nine plus six eight nine two four seven six nine. I just find more from the spreadsheet. Totally. I think it's literally. Not I can't fun. believe you mentioned it. I can't believe he's adding it up. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's twenty one thousand three eighty five oh nine. Oh, you know what? Then I, I bet, um, you forgot the top about, line. Yeah. yeah, the whole top line is looked up. I uh, uh, modify my motion to uh, make what he said. Twenty one thousand three eighty five point oh nine. Mike, you want to confirm that one for us? Right. Yeah, you got it. Good job. Hundred extra dollars. That was that was, that was, that way. That was go to pay those <laughs> coaches. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, actually, I, I'm looking at the actual being kind Google sheet, and I think the top line needs to be omitted. It, oh. So the total is actually right. Oh. Okay. Well, that's why I was. That's why I was trying to yeah. check because. So, it is. The supply and reimbursements have already been done. That was that was that was just from another school. Oh, okay. okay, cool. Yeah. So I, I, I rescind my revised motion and go back to the original. <laughs> I second the original motion, not the revised motion. Okay, any more discussion? That's a good catch, Chris. Red? Yeah. Aye. Chris? Aye. Diana? Aye. Deneen? Aye. And then I as well. I zero. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses for the 2020 2021 school year for the High School Parents Association. Totaling ten thousand six hundred and twenty-one uh, twenty dollars and ninety-one cents. Second. Any discussion? Rich. Um, I. Uh, no, no discussion. Chris. I have a question. Right. Janine, question. Is it eight thousand? Yeah, it's just missing the dot zero zero. Yes. Or is right. it? It adds up eight thousand. Eight thousand. And teacher supplies were given nothing to. Okay. It's eight thousand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says eight thousand. And it adds oh, up. Yes, yeah. Fine. Diana. Mm -hmm. I'm an I as well. Five zero. Thank you. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of one hundred dollars from Gordon College for the purpose of professional development for Christine Morgan at the Batchelder School. Second. Any discussion? Did we add this one up right? <laughs> Rich. Hi. Chris. Hi. Janine. Diana. Hi. I'm an I as well. Five zero. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $100 from Kathleen O'Donnell Buston to be applied to Mr. Hudson's Rise classroom at the high school. Second. Any discussion? Rich. Aye. Chris. 
Aye. Janine. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an I well, I zero. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude an in-kind donation valued at $3,000 from North Reading Subaru to the E. Ethel Little Elementary School for classroom resources and materials. Second. The discussion. And Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. I'm an I as well. Five zero. I bought my car. Can I just say we went through this very fast because it's very late, but these were incredibly generous donations. Absolutely. As always, especially the, the, the PDOs. Parents, yeah. 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 Yep. Very good. Okay. Subcommittee updates. None. Who is that? Administrative report. Just wanted to give a quick update. We got a nice letter from the Massachusetts Foreign Language Association. One of our students, Sophia Kuchar, won first place in a digital art submission. And so there's a very nice letter thanking Ms. St. Arnaud and Ms. Uh, Yamas Castro for their um, participation in this program. They're two of our world language teachers who had a lot of students that participated. Uh, Sophia won first place. Nice. And in the new contract, it is world language now, not foreign language. Well, in the new standards, it's foreign. Yeah. yeah, they haven't changed the name of the association. Mapla <laughs> sounds <laughs> a lot better than Mala, but yeah. Um, any correspondence? For, for subcommittee, apparently there's an SSDC meeting that I can't go to. So <laughs> you get to count for both of us. Got point I just got appointed, and I'm already missing stuff. So, um, future business: we have a meeting Monday, July 26th um, at 6:30 p.m. and Thursday, August 12th at 6:30 p.m. We can still do remote, just so everybody understands. I think our goal, at least starting in September, will be, we'll, we'll talk about July and August later on, whether it's just full virtual or not. Um, I think in September, our goal will be to do it like we've been doing it. We're in person. We'll invite members of the public here in person if they want, but we'll send out a Google link, and I don't know that anybody will show up if they can do it on Google. So, but even though we can do full virtual, the only nice thing about that is if a member of the committee does have to miss, they can still attend. So. Okay. Any other comments, questions? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> okay. Rich. Aye. Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Thank you. Passes 5-0. Thank you, everyone. No call for discussion. No call.